May 15th, 2019 morning session of the Portland City Council. Good morning, Carla. Please Good morning. call the roll. Fish. Hardesty. Here. Udaley. Here. Fritz. Here. Wheeler. Here. And now we'll hear from legal counsel. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in Council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the Council Clerk's Office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony and resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. If it does not, you may be ruled out of order. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When you have 30 seconds left, a yellow light goes on. When your time is done, a red light goes on. If you're in the audience and would like to show your support for something that is said, please feel free to do a thumbs up. If you want to express that you do not support something, please feel free to do a thumbs down. Please remain seated in council chambers unless entering or exiting. If you are filming the proceedings, please do not use bright lights or disrupt the meeting. Disruptive conduct such as shouting or interrupting testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Very good, thanks. First up is communications, Carla. Item 414, request of Stan Herman to address council regarding answering his question. I do not see Mr. Herman here, but just so people know, uh, my office has reached out to him per what I said I would do last month, and we are taking care of that issue. So that may explain why he's not here today. Next individual, please. Item 415, request of Wayne Wigness to address council regarding confirmational bias in federal research on homelessness. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Wayne Wigness. Um, Beginning in the 1990s, the field of research on homelessness underwent a paradigm shift. We went from seeing the issue from a social and even cultural uh, phenomenon to one that today is, is considered to be a clinical issue. Clinical means uh, treatment is, the results of treatment are tied to the place of treatment. While I don't disagree with this, it's a big leap to go from that to the catchphrases that we find in policy discussions today, such as, uh, homelessness is a housing issue, or we know what works, housing first. Um, were these phrases intended to withstand scrutiny, housing would never have replaced clinical in the first phrase, and the second phrase would read more like, we know what works for some, while leaving the rest out in the cold. But these phrases are in fact not, oh. these phrases are in fact more like ploys on group psychology, for which researchers have known for centuries that crowds can only uh, hold simple concepts. And while they may be attenuated to, say, uh, someone contradicting their own ideas, they care little for factual correctness. Uh, the scientific method these research reports are attempting to emulate relies on two parts. One, creative connections, and two, rigorous scrutiny of these connections. Without that second part, it's more like creative writing, not research. Um, real research is inherently open-ended in the sense that the goal develops to simultaneously with our understanding, both the goal and the method do. Understanding is a real goal of research, of real research, I should say. Um, but the fe federal government has targets, not questions, and now they've taken to bullying agencies into compliance with their targets, whereas the focus used to be on alleviating the suffering of, of everyone who is homeless, now agencies are pressured into literally scoring people on how helpless they are and then throwing all of our resources at a minority few, some of which, some of whom are not even homeless for, uh, for the first time. The problem with prevention strategies and with entertaining pipe dreams of solving homelessness by weaning people on private housing is twofold. One, we cannot afford to give everybody their own private unit. The literature is clear on this. The strategies we've adopted, they're not even intended to work for everybody. And two, we cannot predict who is going to become homeless. The literature is clear on this as well. Neither of these things will improve so long as we persist with the false notion that homelessness is a housing issue. Uh, this is a notion that, which has caused us to overlook potentially relevant social and, and cultural factors of causation. 
Uh, homelessness is a clinical issue, not a, not a private housing issue. We were never justified in jumping straight to saying that we should try to give everyone their very own private unit, so at least when it comes at the expense of, of the majority. Um, I've posted a detailed review of what is, has been a guiding federal, uh, supposedly research-based uh, po policy directive on each of you council members' Facebook. Um, decriminalizing life without property is a more pressing issue and the more realistic goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual, please, Carla. Item 416, a request of Robert Patterson to address council regarding homelessness. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the council for having me here again. My name is Robert Patterson. I'm homeless. I'm a homeless activist, and I'm the executive director of Emerald Alley. <clears throat> I recently signed up to volunteer for Senator Elizabeth Warren's campaign for my party's nomination, largely on the basis of her $100 billion plan to combat opioid addiction. I can't think of any plan from any party leader that will literally save the lives of tens of thousands of homeless. Yes, it is revolutionary, but I've spent too many nights laying beside a friend, wondering if they would ever wake up to accept anything less than revolutionary with regards to heroin and the homeless. You see, <clears throat> we homeless are generally a patient and peaceful lot. I dare say we've been lulled into a meek resignation by the indifference of political leaders. But I'm new to being homeless and have untapped reserves of both piss and vinegar, especially when it comes to the safety of homeless people. Mayor Wheeler, I'm pleased to hear about your proposed mobile showers, but I believe that without sufficient attention to the risks that they pose, an overdosed corpse will be found in one. <clears throat> showers are needed, and more of them to be sure, but what is revolutionary are safe injection facilities, which I hope this council will explore bringing to the Portland street. Such facilities would create a space for users to inject under the watchful eyes of a nurse, to test the purity of their drug, and to access clean needles and a safe place to dispose them. Safe injection facilities would save lives, decrease the spread of infectious disease, promote moderation, and act as a portal to, to services of recovery, employment, housing, and mental health. Furthermore, we know that naloxone saves lives, as does the outstanding training in naloxone administration that Outside In provides. What is lacking, however, is having naloxone nearby when it matters the most, in the minutes following an overdose. Therefore, I hope the council will work with regional leaders to equip every TriMed bus with the life-saving medication and to train every driver in its administration. It's an easy precaution to take, and it will save lives. Commissioner Hardesty, I heard you speak once of angels shepherding you through difficulties. Well, through your commitment to Portland Street Response, you're an angel to thousands of Portlanders in crisis. Thank you. $500,000 isn't nearly enough for the good work Street Response will perform, but we'll get there. <clears throat> Most of you know me with regards to Everyone Counts and the work that I've done to ensure that the homeless are counted accurately and fairly in next year's census. That work continues, and I'll leave you with this reminder. Many of us homeless turn away from the census for the same reasons that we turn away from government and from society itself. There is a gnawing sense of loneliness that comes when one is ostracized, an aching otherness that leaves one lacking trust and with only spit and spite for one's tormentors. The traumas of the past bear a thick scar indeed, but what is needed now is not just the tokenism of being counted for a decennial census, but rather a constant mission of understanding us, of honoring us, of asking our forgiveness at your indifference, and of inviting our attendance to the national family and the American dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. May I? Yeah, please, uh, Mr. Patterson. Patterson. Thank you so much for being here. I want to say that uh, the mayor deserves credit as well for the Portland Street response since he did put a half million dollars into the budget uh, you, to make that happen. And we are working cooperatively, uh, our two offices, to actually make sure that we can roll this out in a way that is very humane uh, and serves the purpose that we want, which is to make sure that nobody dies because they're asking for help. I had a question for you about whether or not you've spoken with Multnomah County Commission about the safe injection sites. As you know, that's where the county health clinics are. Mm -hmm. I haven't, no, but, uh, but it's, uh, uh, 
It's a message that, I, that I'm eager to take to them. Yes, I think that they would be very open. I know that the commissioners have been looking at how to make that possible. I think you'll find a very um, welcoming audience if you go and talk to the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. Thank you. You're welcome. Next individual, please. Item 417, request of Brad Perkins to address council regarding Sullivan's, Rose Quarter to Gorge Trail, Rose Quarter, Trailblazers, Cascadia High Speed Rail. That's the list. Wow. <laughs> In two minutes. I'll, I'll try to get it all. I'll try to get it all. After last night's meeting, I don't know. <laughs> Golden State. Um, okay. Thanks all for uh, hearing me today. Portland wants to be a winner. Portlanders want to be a part of the progressive city that blazes a trail to fight climate change. People move here from all other parts of the United States for the great outdoors, weather, historic downtown, bikes, transit, pedestrian orientation, and environmental goals. The trailblazers, timbers, thorns, diamond baseball, and citizens of Portland are ready to make an impact and help us become a first tier city. But we lack the proper planning process to do so. Citizens have the desire to discuss big ideas and plan in small groups if given the chance by leaders. Just five months ago, the city adopted the massive comprehensive plan. It sets a general plan for growth, but will need constant refinement. When there is a need to refine a part of the plan, residents and business people need to be involved as a task force, project team, or community involvement committees to address and direct major transportation development projects. Hearings and open houses for a new bridge, greenways, freeway widening, and road store project is not community involvement. And examples are many. The proposed Sullivan's Gulch Bridge over ID4 had only two open houses. A community involvement committee was never formed. So a viable connection to a future Sullivan's Gulch Trail was never planned. Without a CIC, it took a lot of pressure from the Seoul District Business Association to get PBOT to listen to black community before PBOT made the right decision to make Northeast 11th Avenue the least destructive community greenway. The Green Loop is marching along by city development he department heads without neighborhood and business association support. Nor does it have a CIC. <coughs> ODOT's I-5R2 lane widening project has an environmental assessment that only fools would accept. It needs an environmental impact statement study and CIC to review the results. I appreciate that Commissioner Zhu Daly and Hardesty are in support of this smarter planning approach to this half billion dollar disaster in the hood. Lastly, and most importantly, we need to expand the Albina Vision Group with the Rose Quarter area stakeholders who will study the district between MLK Boulevard and the Willamette River and I-84 to Russell Avenue. This expanded group and the city need not be shy about including its plans, uh, its plans a new Rose Quarter transportation hub and a Cascadia High Speed Rail Station with Willamette Greenway and Rose Quarter to Gorge Trail Corridors. Teamwork makes for a winning trailblazer team. Just as Portland can be a winning city in its inclusive planning efforts only if the city passes the ball to its citizens to play as equals on the team. Um, and I just wanted to draw in uh, how much is being done over at the post office on the other side of the river. What we're asking is fair, fair planning effort on, on our side, the east side. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to also uh, let you know, Mr. Perkins, that the proposed budget has $75,000 in it for the Albina vision to help further that public process. Just so you know. It, yeah, if we could expand the, the uh, group, that, that's the main goal that I would at the, at the area. Very good. Thank you for Thank you, sir. that. Thank you, sir. You bet. One last person, Carla? Yes. Item 418, request of Nancy Lopez to address council regarding police. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mayor Ted Wheeler and council members for your time today and hearing my concerns. Today I'm here to talk about my son's future. I have a soon-to-be graduating senior from Lincoln High School who's here in the back with me. 
Ivan is a smart kid, learner in his circle of friends and sweetheart amongst any adult that knows him. He's part of various cultural clubs such as Brothers of Color and Mecha at Lincoln High School. He will be taking a gap year in August and travel the world and visit impoverished countries to do volunteer work and will come back to enroll in a four-year university. I've educated my son on how to respond when it comes to contact with police because I personally have seen who fills our jails and prisons in the tri-county area, state and federal levels, people of color. As a person of color, I've lived in predominantly white neighborhoods. I introduced my son to neighbors so they avoid calling the police if in case they ever saw him walking home at night from practice. He's not allowed to walk at night unless I'm aware that and it's relatively a short walk. At the early age of 12, I taught Ivan about rape culture because it was a age that girls were now a focus and I wanted him to understand his responsibility as a male. It's always been my mission to make sure my son grows up to being a man, to be a man with a great heart, integrity, humility, intention, and great purpose so that he could one day be a great citizen of any community he chooses to be a part of. Ivan is my greatest pride and joy and he's my only child in rock. I'm a single mother with an education in the criminal justice field and have worked for or with entities such as Washington County Juvenile Department, Multnomah County Juvenile, Portland Police Borough, and various nonprofits. So you can understand why in addition to having great parents, I've learned to be a loving, responsible, strong, and knowledgeable parent so that I can only equip my son for life, but to be a pillar of great strength in his personal life and the lives he comes in contact with. On April 2nd, 451, my son was pulled over while I was the passenger of, a seat, of the seat. He was pulled over allegedly for speeding. As soon as the officer approached the vehicle, he, was, he said, why, why were you going so damn fast? The voice was very condescending and disgusted at my best description. He asked for my son's driver's license while Ivan reached to the back seat for his black school backpack and pulled out his wallet and proceeded to get his license to give to the officer in the moment. I didn't think about this interaction and in this process, I'll explain to the police this piece in the ladder. The officer then came back with a ticket in hand. In this moment, I decided to educate the police officer about the communities of color report as most of the jobs in Multnomah and Washington County I have done have focused on. I explained the fear of Ivan who was very scared and anxious and stressed about the situation. I'm gonna skip a little bit. Um, the, uh, the officer chose to instead tell me he had no law that I had no knowledge of his personal experience and that I had no idea about the reverse racism he experienced as a white male in the quote unquote South Side. This further frustrated me. I'm gonna run out of time. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know about that and I am just asking for support in regards to my son. Thank uh, you. Excuse me, Mayor, I would love to, I'd love to hear the rest of her um, statement if that's okay with the council. Without objection. Okay. Um, Okay, in this moment, I decided to educate the officers about what communities of color report as most of my jobs in both Washington and Multnomah have focused on. We can best, on how we can best serve our communities of color. I explained the fears of Ivan who was very scared and anxious and stressed about the situation. I took a moment to address his approach and how it, it's in these moments that a situation can turn highly brutal, especially with the person of color and the overwhelming bad statistics Portland Borough, Portland Police Borough has against its um, communities of color. The officer instead chose to tell me that I had no knowledge of his personal experience and that I had no idea the reverse racism he experienced as a white male in the quote unquote South Side. This further frustrated me as a p white police officer with much privilege than my whole family together could ever have or my entire community as a whole could ever have to use quote unquote reverse racism as a way to understand how my son could possibly feel in this situation. Later I realized that after Ivan was anxiety ridden for a week, he could not drive. We had to talk to school officials about the situation. We decided to be proactive and figure out ways to support our quote unquote adult school children. Our students need to know how to have, how to live their lives around Portland Police Borough and they need to learn how to have better interactions with our children of color, that is the Portland Police Bureau. I am an Oregon taxpayer and a resident of Portland, and I am appalled that my taxpayer money has yet to see Portland Police Bureau be fully trained on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The city's plan and initiatives of equity are failing our communities of color. This could have been a learning opportunity for both of these men, especially for my son. Instead, it became a moment of distress, sadness, disappointment, prejudice, misunderstanding, and an oppressive matter. 
I later pulled the report and the officer used my statements to benefit his report. Quote, pulled his wallet from his backpack and backseat with no issues is a subjective statement. He had no knowledge what my son suffers from, that my son suffers from anxiety and he was highly stressed. Our communities are currently under attack locally and nationally under the current administration. What I hope for is that Portland Police Bureau continues to improve training, cultural competency, cultural competency, interpersonal communication, and changing the ways the city responds to these types of police contacts. That can either be a moment of learning and opposed to the common theme of stories that make newspaper headlines and stories for the TV. I will commit to working with Portland schools and PPS on how we can best support adult youth that are still in high school to avoid their future trajectory to a grave instead of the bright future the students, regardless of color, deserve. I have contacted an attorney so that my son could understand the situation and his rights, and he is scheduled for a ride-along meeting with the police lieutenant and a police officer, a to-do list that most, if not all, most white families don't feel the need to do. It's time and money, but for me and him, I'll do anything. I also plead that if he can please have this ticket dismissed before we go to trial, because he has chosen to go to trial. My son deserves an opportunity to learn to avoid further issues in the criminal justice and yet become another statistic. I ask that you please protect my son, Ivan Sanchez, and not apologize in the future for laying him six feet under because you have failed to continuously hold Portland Police Borough for all their shortcomings as it pertains to our communities of color. We're under attack and we need your protection. Thank you very much for your time. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to say I'm so sorry that happened to your son. Um, and I want to ask, do you have the officer's name? Please don't tell me. J just yes or no. And yes. if you have the name, yes. I would love for you to come to my office and leave that information. Okay. So you do know the officer's name? Yes. Excellent. Um, is your son here? He is. Please have him stand up. Ivan. Thank you for being here. And I apologize for what happened to you. All young people should feel safe in our community. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so I, I appreciate the last part of your statement because um, my suggestion was going to be since you definitely feel aggrieved based on the facts that you've presented, um, it would be appropriate, and I know the chief would have a particular interest in this issue. Uh, we have, in fact, gone through extensive retooling of the training that's required for our police officers. That includes implicit bias training, de-escalation training, uh, restorative justice training. So they are most certainly making that effort. And uh, I'm hearing from your perspective that you feel that that has not succeeded, that that has failed. And so my recommendation was going to be, how could we facilitate communication between you or better yet, your son, and the officer to better understand what happened. Because it, it sounds like there may have been some misunderstanding both ways here, and I'd, I'd like to see that resolved. And it sounds like you've already taken that affirmative step to do that, mm -hmm. and I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I, Mayor, I just want to say that Hardesty. there's a power imbalance when a 17-year-old child is stopped by a police officer. So I just can't imagine there being a, a, a wrong on both sides. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that there's a total power imbalance and that no young person should be so fearful that they're going to lose their life when they get stopped. Commissioner Hardesty, I, I'm not going to sit here and dispute the testimony that we've had because I don't know what happened. I was not there, so I take her at her word that what she's provided is accurate. And so my recommendation was going to be that we work to facilitate a meeting so that we can ascertain whether there is a misunderstanding. Um, you don't have to agree with me. That's okay. all right. Um, I would just ask that uh, if there's any way that anybody could give me the names of who I could contact for that, because in regards to what I, my testimony, I work in the Washington County um, area, so I contacted individuals that I feel comfortable to have a sit down with my son. I did not contact anybody at Portland Police Bureau because I did not you, feel comfortable. You do not have to. Uh, okay. We have the Independent Police Review Commission through the Auditor's Office and the Ombudsman Program, uh, which is located on the third floor of this building, and they are independent from the police bureau. If you okay. feel more comfortable going in that direction, that's certainly an option that's available right. to you. Thank you very much. Thank I you. will give you my card so that you can contact my office and we'll help you walk through that process. Fritz. 
Thank you so much. Ms. Lopez, uh, thank you for taking the time to come in today. Thank you, Ms. Lopez, for coming in too. And thank you for being a really good mom and for helping us all understand this, this. There are many things that each of us can do to help fix this situation, and the council is very much wanting to fix it. So thank you for telling us what happened and the steps that you're taking as a parent. Um, I, I just really appreciate your work um, in the community and with your son. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank you for being here. Time. Appreciate it. And that completes our communications. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda, Carla? Yes, we have two items, item 424 <laughs> and 425. Very good. Could we please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda? Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Fritz? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Wheeler. Aye. And I'd like to make a note of one item that we have supported on this consent agenda because it's come up a couple of times this week for the past two, with regard to item 422. Uh, this is a grant agreement for the Center for Intercultural Organizing for $40,500, $40,500. For the past two years, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability has resourced Unite Oregon and other community-based organizations in the Southwest corridor to engage low-income renters, transit riders, immigrants and refugees, and people of color in the planning process for the light rail project and affordable housing strategy. Their engagement activities were critical to ensuring that the community's priorities for anti-displacement policies and investments and the results of these activities were included in the Southwest Corridor, Corridor Equitable Housing Strategy, which was adopted both by this City Council and the Tigard City Council last year. Now the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, the Portland Housing Bureau, and Prosper Portland are in the early stages of implementing that anti-displacement strategy. They're committed to continuing to build relationships with those communities most impacted by light rail and the ongoing station planning that's taking place in that area. Preventing displacement of vulnerable populations starts with an early commitment to engaging those groups in the early decision-making process. So this grant will allow Unite Oregon to develop a deeper relationship with the community through the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability's West Portland Town Center planning process. It's also going to help Unite bring historically marginalized communities into the center of the planning process and identify their priorities for building out a healthy, connected town center without displacement. Commissioner Fritz. I'm glad you raised this one. I, I was just wondering, why are we using the old name in the audience ra ordinance rather than the new? And if you don't know, you can I, get back to me later. I honestly don't know the answer to I that I just thought question. that was interesting. That, that caught my attention as well. Very good. We will move on then to the first time certain item, item number 419, please, Carla. Except the quarterly technology oversight committee report from the chief administrative officer. Colleagues, the technology oversight committee provides citizen oversight on significant city technology projects, especially those that are deemed to have high risk or high cost for the purpose of increased accountability and transparency. The independent five-member committee reports on a quarterly basis on projects under its oversight to the chief administrative officer, who then forwards these reports to us here, the council. The quarterly reports include information from each project's external quality assurance consultant and the technology oversight committee's assessment of the project status. I'm now going to turn this over to Heather Hather. She is the senior management analyst from the Office of Management and Finance for a presentation on the report that's before us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. It's our pleasure to be here today. Um, as Mayor Wheeler mentioned, I'm Heather Hafer. And I'm joined today by two people, one familiar face, Jeff Baer, the Director of the Bureau of Technology Services. And a new guest to my left is Jimmy Goddard, um, one of our newer TOC members who was appointed by Commissioner Udaley. And Commissioner Udaley, I want to thank you because Jimmy has been a fantastic addition to our team and I'm thrilled to be sitting next to him here today. TOC members that are not present here today are Diana Garcia for Commissioner Fritz, Victoria Trapp, who represents Commissioner Hardesty, Wolf Pinfold, appointed by Mayor Wheeler, and Leela Nell is our newest member of the TOC, um, appointed by Commissioner Fish. As Mayor Wheeler also mentioned, um, TOC advises Chief Administrative Officer Tom Reinhart, and we're here to present that information that we've given to him for the time of January through March 2019. During this time, the TOC monitored one project, and uh, that's the Portland Online Permitting System, or POPS, which you're all familiar with. TOC is also overseeing the Portland, Oregon website replacement project, 
and the Integrated Tax System Project, but did not rate these projects for this quarter. TOC is also now actively monitoring the Open and Accountable Elections Program, but did not rate it for the first time until April. So we'll be reporting on that at our next update. So with that, I am absolutely delighted to turn this over to my new friend, Jimmy. And um, Jimmy. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good morning, morning. Mayor Wheeler. Uh, my name is uh, Jimmy Godard, and I was appointed by Commissioner Udeli to represent our office at the Technology Oversight Committee, uh, along with my colleagues on the TOC Meet Monthly to review these technology projects. And we are pleased and delighted to see the progress being made on the Portland Permitting Online, uh, Portland Online Permitting System, also known as POPS. We would like to acknowledge the work that Tim is putting into this and understand this is a major lift, but we are confident in the ability to deliver this project. As a matter of fact, yesterday I talked to a business owner on 82nd who did not know I was part of the TOC and she shared with me some great comments about the inspector app as she had an inspector visiting her location. So we also have great feedbacks from the, uh, from on, on the street of, uh, about this effort. We are also looking forward to overseeing the integrated tax system project, which is another complex technology project. And I will yield to Jeff for additional thoughts. All right, thank you, Jimmy. And thank you, Mayor Wheeler, members of City Council. Um, I want to provide a few more uh, focused comments related to the Portland Online Permitting System. As you can see, it continues to trend in the uh, showing the report that's trending in the uh, solid um, uh, yellow, yellow, green, or yellow, green, green categories. So we've got a lot more green than we've ever had before. Uh, we've had a substantial amount of work to uh, complete, and but all indicators in uh, these different categories are showing very positive progress. Uh, two, of the, two of the six work streams have been launched since uh, we've had the um, program moving forward. That includes the development hub, PDX, and also the electronic plans. Uh, and actually, BDS is receiving very positive reviews by the development community for these two features, and they're getting requests to expand the functionality, which we will continue to work on uh, moving forward. Also, the POPS team has been hosting a number of different town halls and open houses to provide project updates and very focused questions about the system and the different features and what's to be expected once we go live. Overall, the POPS team is making very good progress towards our go live date later this year in November. Also, the TOC members also received an overview of the integrated tax system for or ITS, as it's known, uh, which will be another project that will be coming up underneath the TOC purview very shortly. And our next quarterly report will also include the QA assessment on the Open Accountable Elections Project. Uh, we recently brought on uh, Case and Associates as the QA consultant. It might be a name familiar with uh, that council. Mr. Clifford Smith has been working directly with Director Mote and the project team, and he will be providing the Q his QA assessment this coming Monday at our TOC meeting. So with that, I'm glad to pause and answer any questions on any of the projects that we have under, under the review. Commissioner Hurstie? Oh, sorry. It looks good. All right. Thank we're happy to see yellow and green, and we're happy not to see red. <laughs> so are we. Thank you. We appreciate you. this you. report, and we'll see you next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Move to accept the report. Uh, I will accept the motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Fritz, a second from Commissioner Hardesty. Any further discussion, please call the roll. We've lost Carla. <laughs> we just call it ourselves. She, she's finally had enough of us. <laughs> Here she is. We're just calling the roll on the report for 419, please, Carla. Thank you. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Thank you to the TOC members, not only for all your work, but for being here today. Aye. Wheeler? So this wasn't necessarily the most exciting report today, um, and I'm grateful for that, Heather, and to your entire team. The work you do is critically important. And we appreciate the fact that you are there taking a good hard look at the work that we're doing so that frankly, we don't have to because we don't have the bandwidth to dive into the details the way you do. And so I'm very, very grateful for your service and I'm grateful for the work you do to make sure that things are staying on track. I vote aye, board's accepted. We'll see you next quarter. Thank you. Next item, Carla, uh, we can't quite go to 10 one uh, to 420. Let's please go to a second reading item 433. Three. 
433 authorize an agreement with Multnomah County to address youth and gang violence in an amount not to exceed $109,835. So this is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. We've already had a presentation and taken testimony. Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Um, no. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler. This is a position in collaboration involving the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, the Police Bureau in Multnomah County. This is a collaboration that results from the Local Public Safety Coordinating Commission's Local Public Safety Recommendation. Support of this organization is support for the Portland Police Bureau and Multnomah County splitting the costs of the position in the Office of Youth Violence Prevention. The purpose of the position is to implement, monitor, and provide ongoing evaluation of all aspects of the plan under the guidance of the Lipsick Youth and Gang Subcommittee Steering Committee. The coordinator position will offer sustained enhancements and coordination of multidisciplinary and data-driven strategies across the spectrum of prevention and reentry programming, resulting in the achievement of better outcomes for youth, their families, and their community. And the key here is data collection and transparency. I support this position in addition because it leverages strong partnerships emphasizing prevention and intervention rather than after the fact incarceration. The work done provides resources and coordination to address destructive behavior patterns before they become more problematic. This is an exact, excellent example of working together and finding solutions that result in stronger and safer communities. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Uh, let's go to another second reading, item number 434, please. Extend contract with Cascadia Behavioral Healthcare, Inc. to June 30, 2022, and increase the not to exceed amount to $3,223,577 for mental health clinician services. Colleagues, this is also a second reading. There's been a prior presentation and public testimony on this item. Any further discussion? Carla, please call the roll. Fish. Here, my understanding is that the next time this goes out to bid, there'll be an RFP in 2022. With that understanding, I vote aye. Hardesty. My understanding You're is off. that this is your oh, side. Uh, my, uh, my understanding is that this is the fifth time that this contract has been amended. And I am concerned about any contract that we just continue to add money to without actually doing any evaluation of its effectiveness. And because of that, I will vote no. You daily? Aye. Fritz? So I had those questions last week. And in response, I received this binder, um, oh, you got a binder? which is an absolute, it's a page turner. I was fascinated by it. I, uh, I want to thank um, Lieutenant Casey uh, Hetman from the Behavioral Health Response Team, Frank Silver, the Behavioral Health Unit Analyst, and Barbara Snow, the Cascadia Behavioral Health Care Program Manager. It sounds like that the rest of the council didn't get this binder. It is phenomenal work. So I encourage you, Mayor, to have, have everybody get one of these and um, then colleagues for you each to read it because it actually shows that the program has been extremely successful. Um, I thank also Dr. Elizabeth Gerritsen, who is, hang on, I should look into my binder, uh, the <laughs> Training Division Senior Program Manager. Um, I worked with her in my first term when I was in charge of in, uh, emergency communications and uh, Dr. Maggie Bennington Davis, uh, who was then in charge of Cascadia um, and I and, and multiple other all the other jurisdictions who were concerned about public safety with relation to people experiencing mental health illnesses in particular worked together and piloted the first um, mobile response units. So it's really, really impressive to see that 10 years later, oh, not quite 10 years, this program has been really successful. And um, so I'm in th I'm not, last week I was tentatively prepared to support it because of the mayor's um, knowledge and, and insistence that it's part of the solution for looking at street response, et cetera. Um, I'm now very enthusiastically supporting it. Aye. 
Wheeler. Well, rarely is a book written that has such an impact in such a short <laughs> period of time. May I borrow your binder briefly, and then what I will do is make sure that we have copies for the full You have council. to give it back. I it's actually... I'm making a promise right here on camera, live. <laughs> sorry, and you, and you both, I'm sorry, I should be interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just speechless. I vote aye. <laughs> Great program. Glad that we're continuing this partnership. Um, I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. The nice, well, the interesting part, Mayor, of this binder is that there's a report from March of 18. There's multiple reports that have been written along the way. They just haven't been passed along to the council. So it's... I know that sometimes we get so many reports and we don't get now testimony on reports either that um, bureaus might feel reluctant to be giving uh, council the information. At the very least, it would be helpful to get it to us outside of a council um, session. But I think it's important for the public to know what we're doing with taxpayers' money and what the outcomes are. Very good. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I certainly agree, Commissioner uh, Fritz, that uh, it would have been helpful for all the council to have had this information so that we could have studied it and weighed whether or not to support it. I think that that sends a strong message that some people get information and some don't, and I'm troubled by that. Well, I, I asked for it in, in particular last week, and nobody said I'd like that too. I didn't know that I had to ask for information about something that I would be voting on that was over $3 million, but I, I hear you. All right. Um, so I have stretched. Actually, there's one more thing I can do to stretch this out for two more minutes. Um, <laughs> item number 435. Could you read that, Carla? I'm going to pull it back to my office. Yes, 435. Authorize a contract for utility bill printing mailing and presentment for a term of five years for $4.6 million. Colleagues, I am returning this uh, to my office for further work. So um, we will not be hearing item 435 today. And now we're going to take a two minute recess.
session. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We had a time certain item, and, and we're not allowed to start early on time certain items. Carla, if you could please call item 420. Amend permit fee schedules for building, electrical, land use services, mechanical enforcement, plumbing, signs, site development, and land use services be scheduled for the hearings office. Carly, you mentioned everything except the trailblazers in that opening statement. This is the annual rate setting hearing for our permitting bureaus. Here's some context. Previously, we've done this in silos because each council office has a role in the permitting process and various bureaus are involved as well. My goal here today is to amplify this cross-bureau collaboration. We need a fuller, more comprehensive picture of the costs to development from the permitting process because this ultimately affects people's lives, like housing and places to work for Portlanders. Permit fees have not kept up with the cost of doing business, and we haven't had a significant increase in them for quite some time. This is not about development, just for the sake of development. To explain this in detail, I want to now call up Elshad Hajiev, who is already here. Uh, the Business Operations and Finance Services Manager for the Bureau of Development Services. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Elshad Hajiev, uh, Senior Business Operations Manager for the Bureau of Development Services. With me, I have Kyle O'Brien, uh, BDS Finance uh, Manager, to co-present with me. Uh, today, we're here to present you um, our annual fee changes um, in all of our programs at the Bureau of Development Services. To give you a little bit of a background, um, Bureau of Development Services is funded uh, 98% by permit fees and charges. Only 2% of our revenues are coming from general fund and they only support one program, neighborhood inspections. So we pay a, a very a close attention to our uh, fees, to our charges, uh, our revenue collections, because that's what pays our salaries and that's what let us provide services to uh, uh, Portland. Uh, we haven't raised our fees for uh, the last five years. Um, during those five years, we experienced construction boom and there was no need to raise those fees. We were at the cost recovery and we were able to build very healthy reserves. Uh, however, um, the construction boom is um, almost over. We're just getting some remnants, some larger projects coming in as it tr they trickle down. Um, also in the meantime, uh, during that period of time, um, we also experienced not only BDS, but also CD experienced cost of living adjustments, merit, in, merit and pay step um, increases, purse contributions uh, went up, and um, two years ago there were substantial increases to uh, um, uh, salaries and wages for represented employees in their union contracts. 70% um, of our um, expenditures are personnel, so that directly affects the cost of uh, doing business for us. Um, as I mentioned, um, overall development activity has declined and um, that contributed to lower revenue collections than previous years. This is um, uh, substantially due to the um, increase, uh, decrease in the number of multifamily uh, projects coming in into the pipeline. Um, we, um, we have been very proactive in addressing the uh, slow down in construction, um, we implemented bureau-wide hiring freeze. That is in effect uh, through the, uh, December 31st, 2019. We limited um, any non-essential expenditures in the bureau. We also had um, um, a round of layoffs in a, a one program that was specifically affected by those, uh, uh, by the downturn in land use services uh, back in um, January and March. Uh, we're also gaining efficiencies in providing services to our customers. We, you heard from TOC, our electronic plan review is already actually generating um, 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 efficiencies in providing services to our customers, as, as well as the Dev Hub and different apps that we are slowly uh, uh, releasing to, um, to our um, em uh, employees and also in the future to, our, to, to, to be used by our customers. Our fee changes are already uh, incorporated in our financial plan. Um, our uh, BTS Financial Advisory Committee reviewed those changes and they agreed that those are necessary. Um, overall, kind of a strategy for the Bureau been over, over the uh, 
a very long time, is that we keep those changes very gradual. In very rare cases, the, we, um, um, those fee changes are actually substantial. And I will um, focus on the ones that are not kind of a usual gradual fee changes later in the presentation. Um, what we're trying to achieve with the fee changes uh, this year is, as I mentioned, to keep up with the inflation. Uh, just to give you an example, COLA alone, effective July 1, 2019, is 3.9%. So what we're asking overall kind of a, a fee change is a 5%. Um, we also want to make sure that our fee, uh, fees across our different fee schedules are consistent, specifically hourly charges and minimum fees. Um, and again, where the cost of services are way below the, uh, the current fees that are being charged, uh, we are making more pronounced changes for those particular fees. To summarize the changes, uh, the, um, they will affect building, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, site development, science, enforcement, um, and partially land use fee uh, schedule. Overall, it's a 5% increase across the board. Uh, we're not uh, raising fees that are based on valuation. Um, hourly fees are going up to $155 per hour, and they're standardized across all of the uh, programs. Um, uh, the same goes for the minimum fee. It's uh, up to $110 from 95 um, In our uh, flagship programs like uh, Field issuance remodel and facilities permits program, hourly fees are going up to $220, and we're also standardizing fees across those two programs. Um, larger changes is the um, a major project group fee is increasing from $50,000 to $75,000 per project. This is the elective program that the Bureau has for large developers that are willing to pay that much money to uh, have a kind of a a coordination across all of the um, bureaus uh, to, to help them with the project. Um, some of the other fees, the process management fees are going up from $525 to $1,200. Again, it's an elective program. They can go through a regular process and not pay that fee. Um, land use services. We are proposing a slight change to one of the fees that was adopted by the council back in uh, April. This is the historic resource review fee. We've heard from um, our customers, and um, thank you, commissioners and your staff, for forwarding those emails to us. Uh, we looked at the fee again, and we are proposing this time a tiered structure that would differentiate the fee across three tiers. Um, initial proposal, uh, what was adopted by the council, was the increase from 250 to 750. Right now, we are proposing a tiered structure that will range from $900 to $750. $1,750. One, thank you. In both cases, it was $1,750. One, I apologize. $1,750. Yes. Um, we did the outreach. We uh, presented our fee changes to Development Review Advisory Committee and got their support. Um, we also posted all our fee schedules on our website and also included um, notifications in our um, plans examiner newsletter. Uh, we're also are reaching out to different industry groups uh, to um, uh, inform them about those, these fee changes. As Mayor mentioned, uh, we're not the only bureau that is uh, involved in the development review process. There are other uh, city bureaus that uh, are included in that process, including BES, PBOT, Water, Fire, um, Portland Housing Bureau, so um, this is the second year we also present you with examples of how collectively fee changes for, across all of our bureaus affect uh, uh, different projects. In, in the exhibits, you should have seven projects. Commissioner Hardesty has a question. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I had a question about uh, the land use service fee changes yep. uh, around uh, tree, pres tree preservation. Uh, violation review. Uh, what is the difference between type one and type two review? Because the actually, cost is substantially yes. more for type two. I actually have a land use services division manager here with me. I'm going to invite Ooh. her to the stand so she can answer your Please. question. Thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kimberly Talent, Lainey Services Division Manager. Thank you. Can you tell me the difference between type one and type two for tree preservation violations? Well, in looking at the fee schedule tree preservation violation review, there's only a type two and a type three. Oh, my bad, type two or type three, yes. But there's significant difference between type two and type three. That is because a type three review is a staff recommendation to a hearings officer, and so there's an automatic um, public hearing. So that takes more time. Um, there's more notice and notification involved, so the fee is to cover the additional time involved with those reviews. Thank you. My second question is, this is like a, just a general question. <clears throat> Is there a difference in fees paid for building housing that's affordable, uh, that, that's affordable for people to live in? Like when I think about our nonprofit partners and stuff like that, are they paying the same fee that big developers are paying? So, so majority of our fees are based on the valuation. So um, it, it, it is paid, the fees are calculated based on the uh, tables that are created by the inter international code code council and then our fees are applied to that table to calculate the valuation and calculate the fees. The short answer is yes, they pay, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the short say. answer is yes. So there is really no differentiation, but um, yeah. And have you thought about because of the housing crisis that we're in and because of all the bond money we're getting in that there should be an opportunity for affordable housing developers to um, uh, get fees waived? Are we even looking at opportunities to do that? Good question. Um, we do waive some of the fees uh, for some of the projects when the, the fee waiver is requested, whether it's, for example, if it's a low income family doing some um, remodel around the house. As far as the larger projects, um, a lot of times we, we may get some um, direction from the mayor's office and some of the fees might be waived, but it's not a common practice. I would sure like us to look at making that a common practice until we get out of the housing crisis, because I think that there's an inequity built into our fee structure, especially if we're building housing that's really low income housing. So I just can't imagine them paying the same as a big time developer, but we'll talk about that another day. Absolutely. Thank you. Can I just get a clarification? Yes. Because my understanding is that affordable housing doesn't pay the same as a big time developer. And the one example, the most conspicuous example, is that we waive systems development charges. Correct. We do. I guess I was answering from the perspective of BDS. So right. our fees are fees for services. So we have to be at the cost recovery. So course, that's why right. we charge. So yes, in, in certain cases, SDCs are weighed by other bureaus. but. We, as a bureau, we don't have um, authority to do that. Right. Well, yeah. we pretty consistently waive SDC. The, the, the point I was making is uh, here you have the mayor trying to uh, present all of these um, uh, fee increases in an omnibus legislation that shows each of the other bureaus. But the, we, we, what, the one significant benefit that we provide to affordable housing is we waive systems development charges. Yeah. And I think, I think that's an area where, um, by doing so, we, in effect, shift some of the costs to the for-profit development and, and make it easier, uh, more cost-effective to do, to do uh, low-income development. But that's not the subject of today's hearing. Yeah, but, but that, your comment is exactly right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, we do not charge SDC, so that's why I was answering the yeah, question from the perspective the fees, of... So thank you. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. We're talking about apples and oranges. Thank you. And also, um, thank you. Are we? Would we? If we ha if we made a policy decision that we were going to charge for profit developers more in order to cover the fees of the of the affordable housing developers, would that be allowed by state building laws? Would we? Could we do that? I need to research that. I I I don't have the answer to that, but I can get the answer. Thank you. Yep. Please share. When you get it, Absolutely. share it with all Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Great. Does that complete Any your presentation? Yes. Very good. Any further questions before yeah. we so, Commissioner Fish? So I think it's important um, in your report at paragraph six 
of section one, you say that the development review advisory committee fee and regulations subcommittee has endorsed the fee uh, changes referenced in this ordinance. Can you tell us in broad strokes who was on that committee? Representative from development community, from neighborhoods. Uh, we have large developers. We have um, um, a representative from the neighborhood associations. We have a um, representative from um, 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 land use um, advocates. So a, a very diverse group of um, uh, people. And is there, um, was there a general consensus around this? Was it a contested vote? What can you tell us about their recommendation? They don't usually vote. Um, we present the fees, and uh, second year in a row, we do it in a, in a very collaborative manner with uh, other bureaus at the same time. They ask questions. Um, a lot of times, they have uh, comments on certain fees or suggestions, and we take it back, and we look at those fees again. So it kind of goes through the review there. I yeah. see. And remind me again, this is the first f proposed fee increase for how long? Five years. OK. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Fritz. Um, so I asked during the budget hearings about what would the cost be if we were to do a general fund subsidy for to keep the um, historic reviews at $250 instead of $1750. Can you give me that number? Absolutely. Uh, so if we um, revert back to $250 for historic resource review fee, then we uh, the subsidy will be around $87,000 per year. And about how many projects are there? Do you remember that offhand? So um, last year, um, there are two t uh, three tiers, tier one, tier, tier A, B, and C. Uh, so I, I believe tier one is, a, there is a very small number, I, I want to say under five. The majority of them are in the tier B, around 60, and the tier C. Um, I don't have the tier breakdown, but it was 58 50, total yeah. last fiscal year, 74 the prior year. Thank you. That's really helpful. I know we're going to get testimony back, so I might want you to come back after the testimony. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank we'll you. We'll take public testimony, Carla. How many people do we have signed up? We have four people signed Very up. Very good. The first three, please come up, are Maggie, Jim Hewer, and Brooke Best. Good morning. Maggie, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. I think I mentioned before that. Um, when I talked to Walsh Construction that got the uh, thing for the contract for the affordable housing, he didn't miss a beat when he talked about um, composite roofing versus <clears throat> aluminum roofing, and he said composite was cheaper. And, and why can't we have fee schedules for permits that are based on is, is this material going to end up in a landfill? Is it going to hurt people? Is it going to co cause cancer in the making? Is it fuel-based? Why can't we have a fee schedule, whether it's affordable housing or for-profit for housing, that gives lower fee permit fees to people who do gray water systems and composting toilets and uh, solar and wind? <clears throat> Why can't we have um, fee schedules? You know, did you watch uh, Bill Nye, the science guy on MSNBC, and, and see him torching the globe? I mean, even if we cut all carbon out right now, the globe would continue to, to heat up because um, it, it's, it's like taking a roast out of the oven. It still continues to, to um, the temperature still goes up. So <clears throat> why can't we have fee schedules based on uh, better, um, greener um, um, building that, that reduces our carbon impact? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Jim Hoyer. I'm here today on behalf of the Irvington Community Association's Land Use Committee. It's a group of about 20 volunteers, and our job is to twofold. We review historic review applications in the Irvington Historic District, and we routinely work with our neighbors who need guidance in navigating the sometimes murky process of historic resource review. 
We are very concerned about the proposed increase in the Type 1 historic review fees as proposed in this latest BDS schedule found on page 2 of Exhibit C. While this new fee schedule does reduce the fees slightly since the version that went into effect April 1st of this year, the new fees are still out in left field relative to the $250 fee that has been in place since 2013. Uh, I've actually, uh, in the uh, testimony I've set, uh, handed in to you, uh, I've attached to it my testimony for the Portland Coalition for Historic Resources from March of 2013. That was when the $250 fee was originally adopted by this council, uh, as opposed to the initial recommendation by BDS for $475. As the information in that earlier uh, testimony is still relevant. We have 6,000 single-family residences and small plexes covered by historic resource review, either in districts or as individually listed landmarks. And the overwhelming majority of these are not mansions or the homes for the wealthy, but they're ordinary middle-class homes. There are something like 22 exemptions from historic resource review that were introduced in, in March of 2013, uh, but there's still many small projects that will trigger this kind of review. For example, putting a six inch vent for a fireplace, a gas fireplace in your roof under the proposed rules would require a fee of $1,450 for a, a project that probably doesn't cost that much. So it really is a disincentive for people to do the right thing when it comes to historic resource review. I might point out that the districts that are affected uh, have a disproportionately large percentage of people of color relative to the average for the city of Portland. So that further exacerbates the problem. With six years experience behind us, we've learned that type one review is very popular if such a thing could be said of fees. And uh, it allows people to do the right thing. They might grumble at the $250. Now, we acknowledge that some historic review processes are more expensive. BDS includes AD, external ADUs in the, the type one process. We have, actually we think that's probably not following the code precisely, but we've never objected to that because the ICA formally supports ADUs in our area. Uh, however, it might make sense to take that 1750 that's being proposed for accessory structures and make that keep that in place. However, we would urge that if an AD, external ADU is going to be subject to system development charge waivers based on the choice of, of using it for long-term rentals, then we would argue for the HRR to be waived for those as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Brooke Best, and I'm here on behalf of the PCHR. And What's PCHR? Jim Portland Coalition of Historic Resources. I was going to say Jim mentioned them earlier. Um, so I submitted uh, written comments via email as a resident of Lads Edition Historic District. And Commissioner Fritz, you responded to my email and let me know about this meeting, so thank you. Um, I'm here to say that um, the proposed tier, tiered type one fees are still punitive as they cover even the most trivial projects. And Jim pointed out one example of this with the roof ends, um, which are not exempt from historic resource review and still would be charged a $1,450 fee. Um, so pushing this fee increase is uh, objectionable due to the excess fee and the lack of the public process. Um, and then I want to mention also that the code amendment project that's currently underway and being craft, crafted by uh, BPS and BDS staff will likely um, require uh, BDS to revisit this fee schedule because of new process and exemptions that are being proposed there. Um, this is really an urgent matter because there are a lot of projects that are already in the pipeline um, in these various historic districts and many individually listed properties that will need to file applications. And these owners have been expected that they would qualify under the expedited type one $250 review. And I just want to point out um, when BDS staff was doing their presentation 
and they were talking about keeping fee increases very gradual. Um, I just see this one standing out as a really glaring exception. And I, I, I find it like, I, I don't know, I'm just really troubled by it. And when there's a 5% fee increase across the board, and then I see historic resource review being um, slammed with a 600% increase, it just doesn't reconcile for me. Thank you. Thank you. The last person who signed up is Lightning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Superhumanity. Due to the fact we're in a state of the emergency on housing, I'd like to have a moratorium put on any and all fees currently. And again, what I found rather interesting is that when we're talking about the building industry slowing down, I didn't hear anything from the presenters on how we might pick that momentum up. And I was really kind of surprised on that because that's why we're sitting here right now. It's because they had plenty of building going on. And in my opinion, Commissioner Salzman wanted to put in inclusionary zoning. And to you, Commissioner Salzman, that's going to be the biggest failure in this city. And that's your legacy. Because we were supposed to adjust that if we thought the market was beginning to get soft, which it is. We need more building. We need the fees not to change. You're not incentivizing builders now to build. You're, they're looking at this and saying, this is ridiculous. You want to increase your fees, your cost recovery, your 79% personnel costs. Well, guess what? Lay some of your people off. Enjoy your retirement. We're not going to carry you when the market is beginning to soften up because of Commissioner Salzman's failure on inclusionary zoning and then not adjusting with the market. It's an absolute failure. And you know, for my position, as you know, I've been very outspoken on these foreclosures of homes where you go in and, and how you can justify to me ever a senior citizen that owns a home and you walk in one time and hit her with a bill of forty to $50,000, guess what? We need more public input on this. We need public input from those people you're stealing their homes from for foreclosing on them using court code enforcement fees that are outrageous. And you just sink them and bankrupt them and damage their credit ratings and send them fleeing out of their neighborhoods. Again, if anybody deserves to have a moratorium on what you do in your fees, it's you. So in my opinion, there hasn't been enough public input and in how you set these fees is just outright ridiculous. And it's just not, it should not be passed. There needs to be more public input and the developers need to step up and say enough is enough. You keep adding up our fees, we're just going to other states and that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna just have a lot more homeless people out on the streets and enjoy that BDS because you're the problem, you're the reason, and this is why I'm gonna stop from giving you any fee increases because you plain don't deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any further discussion? I, I just wanna point out uh, Commissioner Fritz. I was just like staff to come back, please. Just real yeah, quick, go for it. getting you bet. time going by. So I, I appreciate um, the folks who came in to testify at short notice, and uh, also you're getting me answers on at short notice. Um, have you had a chance to look at Mr. Hoyer's suggestion to increase the first two by 300 to 300 and then keep the other at 1750? Yes. Um, so. Um, I think you're asking about the, what the subsidy yeah, would be. Yeah, what would the in subsidy that case, need to that be? That would be seventy thousand dollars. Seventy thousand dollars. Yes, if we uh, increase the type A and type B only to three hundred dollars and keep the type C at seventeen hundred fifty dollars, then the subsidy would be uh, around seventy thousand dollars. And Ms. Best mentioned some other process that's coming along that might affect how many projects are subject to this. So, can you tell me something about that? Um, I will have to ask Kim Talon to join me um, and talk about that project. I know very little about it. Hi. Um, 
Um, that is the Historic Resource Code Improvement Project um, that Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is working on. Uh, I do not know the timing of that, but our intention was to reevaluate our review fees um, as part of that project and then bring to you any potential or needed um, fee schedule changes with that. Okay. That may adjust the tiers or the scope of work or the procedures. Thank you very much. And Mayor, do you happen to know offhand if the historic resources inventory is funded in your budget? So it's being directed to be funded in the next fiscal year and we will direct that funding from existing resources. But yes, it will be completed in the next fiscal year. Well, it's really great that these fees are coming at the time that we still uh, haven't finalized the budget. And so and we're not voting on this today, right? It's moved to No, this is a first reading. Yes, yeah, so before ne next week, we'll be voting on this and also having the pro discussions on the budget. So potentially we could find some one-time money for a subsidy this year pending that um, review. Um, so to be, the discussion to be continued, thank you very much so, for raising this issue. Could I ask a question related to that? Because as, as you were giving the answer to Commissioner Fritz earlier about the $87,000, that, that question was going through my mind as well. Um, but there's, there's two things I noticed in the ordinance that raised questions for me. First of all, um, the fund that we're talking about, it's called the Development Services Operating Fund. Yes. And that was created in 1988. And it was established, it says, with a policy that construction-related programs in the fund would be fully self-supporting. That is correct. Is that part of the problem here that you're operating under that existing ordinance that requires this fund to be self-supporting? We are required to be to recover all the costs. Okay, yes. so is, is that one impediment to what Commissioner Fritz is, is mentioning as a possible solution here? What Commissioner Fritz, uh, Fritz. Fritz is um, mentioning is a subsidy from the general fund to cover the costs that we're not recovering via our fees. Would it require us to change the 1988 ordinance if we were to subsidize? Uh, no, because the, the, so one of the reasons why these fees, especially land use fees, are going up that significantly is because land use services program lost general fund support two years ago. Um, and over the years, that support was uh, dwindled down from $2 million per year to a $1 million a year, and then 600000 and then it was gone. So that's, that's the reason why we're here, and that's why the, these fee increases, specifically for the land use program, are so substantial, because we don't have that funding anymore. So there is no need to change that ordinance because in the past, the program was getting general fund. Okay, that's and the it's rationale. Done now. The rationale for that was yeah. that there's public benefit in these kinds of reviews and therefore it's appropriate, it was deemed appropriate when we had general fund to be able to um, subsidize that so you didn't have to raise the yeah. other fees. And, and I appreciate in, in the narrative the, the discussion about the steps you have taken to prevent fee increases yeah. over the last five years. And I want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. Um, the second thing that caught my attention was the requirement, and I believe this is state statute, but I'm not positive. It, it reads like it's a state statute, okay. so I'm sort of inferring it's a state statute. It says fees charged must be used to cover the cost of administering and enforcing the state building code only. Correct. And may not be used to cover the cost of administering or enforcing local codes. That's exactly correct. So the Bureau is comprised of two very distinct group of programs. One group, and the, the, that's the largest group of programs that are being delegated, the authority has been delegated to us by the state of Oregon to administer them. Those are building, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical, any, any kind of programs, combination of those like FPP and FER. So those programs, the state law, uh, does not allow us to intermingle funds that are um, from those four or five programs with the uh, programs that are enforcing local code. Land use services is a program that is enforcing local code. Got it. So, and uh, even land use services, uh, CD code and um, um, prevents us from charging more um, um, than average or actual cost of providing services. So there are very, very distinct borders and uh, limitations on how uh, revenues from each program can be used. Okay, so, that's very helpful yeah. for me. I appreciate it. Any further questions? I have a question. What, 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 is, what is our deadline for resolving this issue? 
Well, the second reading is next Wednesday. I understand, uh, but yes. do we have, are we under a statutory deadline? For, uh, for particularly for the land use fee, no. For the rest of the fees, uh, yes, because um, there is a, the fees are effective on uh, July 1st of 2019, so uh, we need 30 days before those, those go into effect. So there is no... So we have till the end of the month. Basically. The answer to your question is no, but it's just the timing. Well, I'm just anticipating that someone may be, you know, it is possible that someone will be bringing an amendment okay. to soften the blow on historic resource review fees. And I want to just make sure we have the time, if someone does, to fully debate that and take that up. Okay. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, oh, Mayor. Sorry, that, um, that to uh, Commissioner uh, Fisher's point, um, I wanted to know what your reaction was to the gentleman who said it would cost $1,450 to review putting a gas fireplace into a home. Uh, if, uh, based on what you're proposing, does that sound reasonable or does that sound like something that a regular homeowner would be able to afford? I cannot speak to a regular homeowner. I, I just can speak from the perspective of our bureau as far as uh, how much it costs us to to uh, review that particular case. But and it sounds like you're just going to go out and, and see if they put it in correctly, right? Not only that, but... Um, no, so the latest review process requires the, a planner to be assigned. They review the application materials against the zoning code requirement, write a letter to the applicant outlining any... Um, discrepancies or additional information we need. There's a public notice, so we have notification requirements and mailing costs, so that involves other staff. There's a public comment period where we take in public comments, and then we respond to those in a written decision. Um, so there is a site visit, but there's a lot of um, work happening behind the scenes on the noticing, on talking to customers, talking to interested parties, uh, and issuing the written decision. And you were doing that for $250 before you proposed a fee increase. Is that correct? That's correct. So, again, it, it just um, seems an enormous jump. Right. Um, but, again, in prior years, we had general fund money to subsidize the difference. So these rates reflect what the cost of our services are to do those fees. And Thank I, you. you know, I, 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 I do think you should anticipate um, some uh, amendments coming forward because I, I don't think that that's an appropriate increase. I think that's way too radical. It would be great if you had a tiered system based on the complexity of what you were doing, but just to go from 250 to 1450 just seems outrageous to me. So there is, this fee schedule does include a tiered system. So there's a tier ABC. Um, you know, one option would be to change tier A, which is the $900 fee, to include other minor work. Um, this scope of work um, was picked out and selected because that's when, when I could group that work together, that's where I could show that the average cost of doing that work was at different rates. So, you know, one option would be to put roof or um, fireplace vents in a tier A. So I, I just want to say I greatly appreciate the bringing together all this information and trying to create one consistent document. I know the public will love that, that they don't have to worry about going from one bureau to the other to figure out what the fees are. But I do think the fees must be reasonable. So I appreciate the presentation and look forward to working with you to make it better before the vote. Thank you. Good, Commissioner Fritz. I just wanted to thank Commissioner Fish for pointing out the timing issue. And I think even if mm. we have an amendment next week, we then have another week after that before the end of May. So I think we can still get it in effect Correct. by July 1st. Yeah. That will push it to, to May 29. We still have 30 days uh, for it to be effective. So thank you for noticing Thank you very that. much. Yeah, very good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the presentation. That was very helpful. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. And I would like to switch the next two items, please. I'd like to take up the first item, please, on the regular agenda, item 431 next, please. 431, amend an intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County in an amount not to exceed $197,160 
and extend funding through March 31, 2020 for the forensic consultant contract expenses related to the National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Program. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Molly Dahl. I'm the Detective Supervisor of the Portland Police Bureau's Sex Crimes Unit, and with me is Susan Horman, the Forensic Consultant employed by the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. Uh, a brief background, PPB was awarded three sexual assault kit initiative grants since fall of 2015. The grants resulted in 1,754 untested sexual assault kits being tested. The Saki grants also funded victim advocate and investigator positions, a nationally recognized and distributed uh, database called SAMS, and reimbursed the county for a district attorney, a forensic consultant, and a investigator dedicated to the Saki cases. All kits have been tested as of fall of 2018. To date, the Bureau's work group has produced five convictions and recently indicted their sixth sexual offender. There have been over 300 CODIS hits that have been uploaded into the national database. One of the grants re reimbursed the district attorney for a half-time forensic consultant who acts as an intermediary between the private lab, mm -hmm. the state lab, and the Bureau. The consultant evaluates complex DNA findings and recommends how to proceed after a CODIS hit. It's OMF. The IGA amendment will allow the city to continue reimbursing the, the district attorney's office for the consultant's work through the end of the first grant period, which is March of 2020. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Susan Horman, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, testify today. So as Molly Dahl had um, said, my job is as a forensic consultant. I work for the DA's office, but my primary job is to is to review all of the information that comes in on these sexual assault kits. As Molly had said, we have completed the testing, which is only part of the case investigation. We had decided when we were doing this project that we were going to do a 360 review of all of these sexual assault kits, which means that we're not only going to look at the test results, but we're also looking at the information from the hospital and from the police reports to see is there additional testing that could be done that might assist in the investigation and bringing these cases forward. So what we're doing now even though the testing has been done, is reviewing every single one of those cases very thoroughly. And my job is to sort of summarize all of that information related to the evidence and make a recommendation that, you know, if we did this testing, this might move the investigation forward. And as part of our multidisciplinary team, we discuss that recommendation, we discuss the, the DA's office take on the viability of the case as well as the investigator's input. So that's really my primary responsibility and why this uh, project continues to take um, so much time even beyond the testing is because we really are doing that thorough review of every single case. Also, you know, my secondary responsibilities are when the case goes to trial, when they bring in forensic experts from the crime lab or from the private laboratory, I help the DA in, you know, sort of that intermediary between science talk and, you know, what needs to be presented to the general public. Um, sort of that communication then with the laboratory, if there's some technical questions that need to be resolved, I'm there to do that. And really just overall education to the multidisciplinary team and to the DA's office on what the scientific evidence means and what our options are moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony on this item, Carla? Yes, we have, I think it's just three people. Very good. Uh, Please call them up. Okay. Uh, Nancy Lopez. Thank I you. I think she left. Okay. Then we'll go with Lightning, Maggie, and Charles Bridge Crane. Good morning. Uh, there was an article in one of the papers the other day about a woman 
who had gone in to do um, a test kit and uh, someone in uh, the testing process notified her, uh, her rapist that he was going to be charged. And uh, then she was harassed continually and then raped again by the same person. So I want to make sure that whoever's doing the testing, um, that they're really uh, being secure about their information about the person and uh, they're protecting their identity and that these, uh, the veracity of these testing kits are <clears throat> going through their uh, double checking process to make sure that they go to the crime lab uh, very securely and that at the crime lab they double check and that the people who are doing it are not told anything about uh, anything, you know, so that they're uh, med you know, the clinical aspect, the crime lab aspect is tested where the tester is, is blind to any knowledge of, you know, what the uh, circumstances are for testing that sample. So I, I want to see, you know, I don't want, you know, the 4% who are innocent are, are who end up in jail are in, innocent are are innocent because the government messed up somewhere along the way, so we don't want that happening. So, um, but we don't want information about women who go to get tested to get out, uh, and then for them to be harassed by their uh, assaulters. So. Uh, that's my concern, is all along the way, how are we protecting the process for veracity and, secure, and security? So that would be my comment to the test kitters. Very good. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, let's be honest about why it's very important for you to vote yes, even though it's a strange and I think wrong impact on the budget. What you're doing is clearing up the mess of past administrations. While the Portland police were buying a fancy riot control vehicle and tear gas, and while the president of the Portland Police Union was talking about what a cesspool he lives in, we were not adequately funding tests. As a matter of fact, we never actually ourselves adequately funded the testing of sexual assault kits. We got bailed out by the Manhattan District Attorney, I believe it was, Cy Vance. Uh, there was special funding from something that happened in the city of New York. And thousands of uh, victims of sexual assault in Portland that had had their evidence ignored and not processed are finally, uh, when you getting help and getting, uh, when, you've passed, when you vote yes on this with some additional services so that we can find uh, sex offenders that could have been apprehended years ago if the Portland police and the district attorneys at that time had been doing their job. So obviously you need to pass this uh, money, but you need to do it in the context of saying, whoa, our priorities for policing were screwed up. We were interested in buying tear gas that in the past has been sprayed out in this block right here when brilliant police officers cha chase rioters towards City Hall with all the antique glass that has been knocked out of the windows before you were Mayor Ted. All the there was a couple weeks when all the bottom windows were boarded up. Amanda Fritz remembers those days when the bottom windows were boarded up here on 4th Avenue. Uh, that was not from a riot. It was a nighttime vandal all by themselves. Um, so when you pass this money, make a silent or spoken commitment that the Portland Police Bureau will always do better at assisting and providing services, forensic and otherwise, to victims of sexual assault, and not so much about harassing citizens about whether they think the police are murderers or anything like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, uh, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Superhumanity. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to, or I stressed before on this issue is that 
what I want to make sure is that with this forensic consultant is that you also have the ability to provide information on what you think is necessary to update our forensic labs. And, and again, I'm talking state owned. As you know, when we went to the private labs, say in Salt Lake City and other areas, what I want to make sure is that obviously what has been stated on why this has taken this long to get to this point is funding. And I've stated from my position numerous times that's, that's not even to be used as an excuse on this, on not getting these uh, sexual assault kits tested in a timely manner. And there were other foundations, nonprofits that would have funded that money almost immediately if you would have asked and said, we are having a problem with funding. So now let's take it another step and let's start looking at the forensic labs. Overcapacity, not able to do this fast enough. We need to look at the equipment. We need to look at the new advances in technology. We need to look at, do you want to buy the equipment or lease the equipment because things are changing so fast on this type of technology? That really needs to be analyzed on how to update the current forensic labs, which are state and which we utilize, and to make sure that we can meet certain time frames on getting these kits tested. And we need to have the most advanced equipment to do that, and that's why I want to have input from the forensic consultant on this issue because you go to the various labs, you understand everything about the labs, but you also understand that I don't want to hear, we need more funding to update the equipment because if we need updated equipment, then we should also be getting funding for that equipment, and that's what I want to stress here is not to use the private labs in other states but to continue to use our state labs and make sure that they are up to date with the technology and that needs to be looked at and focused on. But because again, if you keep throwing back the funding reason for not testing these kits, I don't buy it. It should have never happened and somebody made some big mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Does that complete public testimony? Yes, that's all. So I'm going to move this on in a minute, but first of all, I want to make a few acknowledgments. First of all, I want to thank Sergeant Molly Dahl for continuing to fight hard for this program and ensure uh, that we are up to date on the testing. And I want to thank Susan Horman for her work as our forensic consultant, and uh, I appreciated their testimony. Uh, this is a program that was actually started in the fall of 2015. The grants resulted in 1,754 untested kits being tested. It also funded a victim advocate as well as investigator positions. And uh, the question of the database that was raised is central to all of this. This also helps connect us to a national database with all of its security protocols. And then, of course, it also reimburses the county for one district attorney that is associated with this program, the forensic consultant, and an investigator dedicated specifically to Saki cases. Uh, as was said, all kits, all kits have now been tested as of the summer of 2018. So we are now caught up on the testing side. As has been mentioned, there are other steps in this process that we do not necessarily control but we are responsible for the part here at the local level, and I'm pleased with the work that we're doing to get us up to speed. There have been five convictions as a result of going back and taking a harder look at this data, and it's my understanding that just last week, a sixth sexual offender was indicted under this program. So we're seeing good work, and uh, without further ado, I will just say this, this will allow us to continue to uh, work with and reimburse the DA and the consultant for the work that they're doing in partnership with us. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. I would now like to move to item number 432, please, Carla. Mm -hmm. Extend contract with Central City Concern to provide treatment services, transitional housing, and support services for chemically dependent homeless adult chronic arrestees to June 30, 2022, and increase the not to exceed amount by $6,477,785. Very good, thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Emily, I understand you're kicking us off, is that correct? I am, thank Very you. Very good. 
Uh, I'm Emily Rocha. I'm the service coordination team uh, program manager embedded within the, the behavioral health unit at the Portland Police Bureau. Um, I'm with uh, Melissa Bishop, who is the associate, associate director of recovery housing programs with Central City Concern, um, as well as um, Tony and James and Fletcher is missing somewhere. He's right here. He doesn't have a chair. Um, who um, are representing um, current participants in the program and also um, uh, graduates of the program. Uh, I also want to just point out in the audience and folks who um, are here representing uh, the program, the service coordination team, if you could stand and raise your hand. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, uh, those in the audience are representing uh, graduates, uh, staff uh, in the program, um, and graduates from actually day one of the program um, all the way up to current um, who wanted to show their support today. Uh, this contract continues the partnership between the Portland Police Bureau's service coordination team and Central City Concern uh, through their Housing Rapid Response Program and Supportive Transitions and Stabilization Program. The Service Coordination Teams uh, is a crime reduction pro program for the city of Portland. The Service Coordination Team is responsible for coordinating law enforcement, criminal justice, supportive housing, and treatment resources for individuals who are experiencing chronic addiction, chronic homelessness, and chronically in and out of the criminal justice system. In collaboration with partners, the Service Coordination Team offers direct access to behavioral health treatment, housing, and robust wraparound services. The individuals we serve have very complex needs, and we've developed a program that treats the root causes of the behaviors, therefore breaking the cycle of addiction and crime. Another component of the program is the collaboration with the Behavioral Health Unit and Central City Concern, which provides direct service-connected housing for individuals assigned to the behavioral health response teams, the officer clinician teams within the Behavioral Health Unit. The goal is to decrease police contact by assertively addressing the needs of the individuals with mental health, co-occurring disorders, and unstable housing. For over 10 years, this program has shown a positive impact not only for the community, but for the individuals served. Both components of the program show success in reducing police contact. We entered into the current contract through, the, um, through an RFP process in fiscal year 16-17. We are asking for a three-year extension of the contract with Central City Concern. We have a well-established, dedicated partnership, which we've worked together to continuously evolve the program to address the complex needs and barriers of the individuals we serve. Um, I did uh, give out data points um, to the commissioners and, and mayor, and I, I hope you were able to review those, but would you like me to review them again? I, I think it would be good for the public to hear them. Okay. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, pick your favorites then. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Highlights, perhaps. Highlights, OK. Um, we are currently in the 11th year um, of evaluation with Portland State University capstone study. So this is the 11th year. We're currently in that. Um, the 10th year in 2018, um, what they find is 31% of the individuals who engage in the program for over 30 days complete the program. Individuals who complete the program have an 86% reduction in crimes the year after exiting the program. 75% of all participants, whether they complete or not, actually have a reduction in crime as well. Uh, and cost, they also do a cost-benefit analysis, and they show that every dollar spent on the program is a $13 savings in just jail beds and criminal justice costs alone. So it's $26 million of savings. Um, we Commissioner Hardesty has a question. Thank you. Um, you know, most programs with a 30% success rate, we would say were a failure. Mm -hmm. Why do we think this program is a success with such a low success rate? Um, there's a twofold. Um, that uh, one, I'm actually very proud of that, um, knowing the clients and the complex complexity of their needs. This is chronic. I, as I said before, chronic addiction, chronic homelessness, chronically in and out of the criminal justice system, that's really hard to break that cycle. And, and we're, we're talking about folks that have 
have been in the cycle for 10, 20, 30 years, and if we're expecting someone to get it right away, we're, I, it's, it's not realistic. Um, but what we want to do and what we want to do in this program is to make sure that if someone is not successful, that they're gonna come back to the program. They know where to come back to. They know where to walk through the door. I get passionate about this. <laughs> And, and so we, we want to make sure that if that's not the time for them, then that they can come back, that that door is always open. And I want to be clear. I love the work that Central City Concern does. That is not a problem for me. I just know that the service coordination team was added into funding mechanism uh, when the Department of Justice came. And it's never been a program that I thought, I thought it was a program that worked directly with the police and community members. And now there's a component that has central city concern as, the com as one of the key pieces. I, I love the work that central city concern does, yes. so don't get me wrong. Oh, sure. I'm just trying to understand how that fits into working with the police to address the issues mm -hmm. that central city concerns addresses with or without police intervention. Right. Um, so, so actually, it was, it was established prior to the DOJ settlement agreement. I, I was um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, that was 2008 when we entered into the kind of what we called the service coordination team. And that's when providers came directly in the table. Um, and that was uh, with Central City Concern even at that point too. So all of this is about services. So the the intersection between law enforcement and the criminal justice system and our, our clients are, are going to be there, but this is an opportunity and have an access to break that cycle. So um, is so that yes, answer your from, question? Well, from the beginning, it, the police started the service coordination team and they reached out to community service providers. Yes. I'm just trying to get a clear picture today. Mm -hmm. What is the service coordination team and who are the players that are involved in it? Myself. So myself is the program manager, so kind of the project manager over the contract. I have one officer that is assigned to, to me in the service coordination team. So it's really just the two of us. Everything else goes to services. Everything else, because that is the most important uh, component of this, is it's, it's not us, it's for them. So Thank that's you. why this contract and this money for this contract is all going to services, could, not could, myself. Could I also officer. add maybe a few highlights sure. first? First of all, the, the data that you provided, the 31% of individuals, that is the percentage of individuals who complete the actual totality yes. of the 30-day program. That is not the success rate. That is the completion rate for the program. And that is consistent with drug and alcohol outpatient treatment programming nationally. Right. And so um, you know, for a lot of people, and I come from a family where addiction has been a significant issue, I know that the first time one seeks that treatment, the success rates tend not to be very high. It is a very right. difficult process. And the people who are going through this program are amongst the most vulnerable in our community. They've been homeless for a long time. They have been... Um, you know, living under conditions and trauma that makes it a very difficult proposition to begin with. The statistic that's more interesting to me that you gave is that when people go through these programs, they are not being cycled through other social service programs. They're not on the street, they're not in shelters, they're not having interactions with the criminal justice system. Um, they are in fact uh, able to restore themselves and their lives through their hard work with the support of this program being in place. Where the public safety interaction is, um, you know, one of my, my favorite comments was in one of my early meetings with Chief Outlaw, and she was reading through this program, and she's like, this is extraordinary. We're providing housing. We're providing housing. Yeah. And you know, meaning the police bureau through its funding is providing housing? And the answer is yes, because the people we are housing are people who repeatedly had had interactions that were not very positive with law enforcement. And there, there was an opportunity here to realize that something other than jail would be a better investment. And you said it's a 13-fold return on investment. 
and it reduces interactions with the criminal justice system to the tune, I think you said, <coughs> of 75% uh, overall, um, which is a good thing for everybody. That's what's called a win-win-win. And that's why I support what you do. Thank you very much. And I support Can what I you do because of the people sitting in this room who have been through this program, who knew what their lives were like before and what their lives are like now. Uh, and I... I know. <laughs> She's telling me not to cry. Uh, <laughs> um, and, I, and I also wanted to highlight, and I think that you were talking about this too, is um, again, it's a very underserved population. No one else is serving them. Not with the intensity of services that are needed. Um, and this is a, a population not just in the city, but nationwide that is not getting served. Um, and we all, we all know that it's worth it because they're here. Um, and they're, they're very, I'm, now I'm off track. Now, <laughs> um, they're very embedded within social services. Um, uh, our, our folks get employment and then want to give back. And they're in Lukedorf and Volunteers America and Central City, Urban League, um, Cascadia, Unity. They're all working there because they know, and, and they're the ones who know how to get through um, their their needs and their barriers, and why not reach out to other people? Um, I have a little bit more. <laughs> um, so the the relationship goes beyond performance measures and data. Uh, this is about long term solutions and quality of life. We're serving individuals who historically and currently do not have direct access to the services that they need. This population again is very underserved and not only in the city, but nationwide. We are, we are a referral source for hospitals, social, service, social services, um, from detox, outpatient, residential, the criminal justice system, parole and probation, uh, several diversion programs, because you have to divert to something. Um, so we're partners with LEAD, with McJERP, Start Stop Drug, drug Courts, uh, the Joint Office of Homeless Services uh, and their Navigation Intensive Outreach Teams, Urban League Transition Projects, Central City Concern, I could go on and on. We are, we are a referral source because we, we want to make sure that wherever um, our participants are landing that we offer services. Uh, I want to be very clear that this is a voluntary program. Uh, you do not need to be on probation not court mandated, individuals aren't getting arrested just to get into the program. Again, it's very voluntary and there's no enforcement to stay in the program. I wanna give the opportunity to, uh, to Melissa Bishop uh, to give an overview of the specific services uh, that our clients receive. Um, so Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Bishop, the Morning. Associate Director of Recovery Housing Programs at Central City Concern. I wanna thank you, Mayor and Commissioners for uh, letting us be here today. Um, I really represent like the dream team, a team of people that come every day to work in the HRR program to, to really work with our people. Um, and, and I just wanna talk a little bit about the services that they give to every client that walks through the door. Like we don't tell people no. When people walk in and they need help, we help them. And so we're doing stabilization. We're a low barrier stabilization program. So people uh, are coming in, they need to be linked to alcohol and drug treatment, we're doing that. They need to be linked to mental health services, we're doing that. They need to see a doctor so they can stop going to the emergency room when something is going on. We do that, we make sure they have insurance. Um, we're doing intensive case management. That means that they're meeting with their case manager daily, sometimes some most of the time daily when they're first new and then you know every other day they're coming to uh, meditation groups check-in groups um, early in the morning to help them plan their day um, we are doing uh, a peer mentor so we have uh, peers i mean who best to help our our folks than somebody who's walked in their shoes so we have a robust peer mentor um, position that uh, two peers that work in our program they're taking people to food boxes appointments um, going um, taking them to recovery based community meetings they're uh, just really connecting with them movie night like when's the last time they got to see a movie and just sit there and just have that normalcy so they're doing all of that um, they're also uh, doing groups life skills 
Uh, they are uh, doing MRT groups, which is moral recognition therapy groups. They're doing um, women's group, men's group, uh, like light uh, recovery-based groups. We're not treatment. We're, we're, you know, we're housing, but we're doing those groups to kind of enhance the stuff that they're doing in treatment. Um, we have a robust right now outreach group. Uh, we have an outreach person and uh, a couple of the mentors in our housing special that, that are going out into homeless camps and, and looking for our, our people. And so, I mean, we're going above and beyond because we want to keep our doors open to people that need those services. Um, we uh, have employment and employment specialists embedded in our program. So like people are getting LinkedIn as soon as they move to phase two, we're talking about employment. We're talking about next step housing. Like our, our exits to permanent housing are better than they've ever been. It's amazing. Our people are leaving employed and housed and they're staying employed and housed for 12 months after they graduate our program. That's, it's, that's incredible. Like the impact that has on the community, those clients' families are, are really amazing. Um, we're meeting basic needs. We're uh, you know showing people how to have fun in recovery, and, and and showing them really what a normal life can look like. And so um, we have a robust amount of services, and um, people don't leave our doors without their needs being met, and they know where to come back to. We're building a community, and that's what these people have been missing for so long. And so I think that's the important part of this program is we build community here. And so I just want to um, just advocate and, and just talk about the amazing services and the amazing team that delivers those services every day. I think that's the, the point I want to drive home. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. And especially the, the staff. And I, I, I always love Central City concern for um, giving second chance employment. Yeah. And so like 90% of the staff have lived life experience um, all the way up to management as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is very, very important when someone walks through the door. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we would love to, uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah. James, do you want to just speak? You can just slide the mic over, James, if it's easier. <laughs> My name is James Renz. I would like to uh, first thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioners, for listening to us today. Um, I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the Portland Police Bureau, the HRR program, which has been mentioned, and one of the frontline workers, Ben L., who approached me on the street and gave me the opportunity to engage this program. Uh, I've been given all the tools. I'm a graduate of the HRR program. I've been given all the tools to reach self-sufficiency. Self I work for Central City Concern now. I work for the Clean Start One crew uh, full-time. Uh, I'm a union member. I've never been a member of a union in my life. Um, I am moving out to the Blackburn Center from the estate building, uh, the estate hotel, uh, August 1st. Uh, I'll be paying my own rent. Um, I'd like to thank the case managers involved uh, peer support, which have already been mentioned. Uh, housing specialist who's working on a budget with me, uh, Wendy Mc McNair. Um, these amazing ladies and gentlemen have put my life back on track. Some of my work involved, but I was guided through this program. I didn't have to walk through this alone. Uh, the MRT program, which has been mentioned, the moral recognition therapy, uh, gave me a chance to go back and find out my part in the things uh, that I've done in the past. Um, I thought that was very important. Outpatient treatment through Central City Concern Recovery Center. Uh, and I'm just honored to be given a chance to represent Central City Concern. Thank you for listening to us today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Mather. Hey, Tony. Um, and uh, I would also like to second all those thank yous because people have put in a lot of hard work for me uh, that I didn't know was actually available. A um, little small amount of background. Uh, so I have over 20 years of drug addiction and homelessness, uh, you know, as a, as a minor. Um, and I, I can say from firsthand experience that they pretty much go after a while, they go hand in hand, you know, to deal with the homelessness and the trauma from everything that can possibly go wrong out there. You know, just not having a bed, uh, it got to the point to where the easiest thing to do was just not to sleep because I have nowhere to sleep, you know. Um, but I appreciate people giving me a second chance. 
Uh, as of right now, I have uh, 25 months clean and sober. Uh, uh, I'm also a recent graduate of the Star Court program. Um, you know, I got released from a 45 month suspended sentence because of that, uh, because somebody gave me a second, second chance. Uh, otherwise that would have been my third trip to prison for the distribution of drugs. Cause that's what I did. That's how I survived. I did that for 20 years. Um, I can't count how many numerous times I've been in and out of jail and prison. Um, you know, but now I too am also a member of Central City Concern. I work for the Stip Clean Start program also. Thank you. Um, going around around the east side of the river, helping clean up the city. Um, you know, and it, I never, never would have expected that uh, I would actually get paid by the same city that I spent so many years destroying, pretty much. You know, uh, but just helping other people either stay where they're at helping clean the city back up like it gives me some fulfillment like I feel I feel good about myself um, which I didn't when I was high um, uh, I've also graduated MRT uh, we I've graduated the rent well program so that I can learn how to be a good tenant um, I am also waiting for the Blackburn to open up because I will be moving into the Blackburn too as soon as it opens um, and actually I was just cracking jokes with people the other day uh, as just the other night at Target, I bought the first pillow in my life. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, all the other pillows I had were given to me, prison, county, you know, or I wasn't sleeping, you know, and uh, it's just like small things like that that just keep me pushing forward. And I really appreciate the second chance. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. <laughs> Hi, my name is... is uh, Fletcher Nash, and uh, I'm a product of the HRR program, Central City Concern, and, you know, um, I was just sitting here thinking, um, and I got kind of sad, because the person who got me into the program is not is not here anymore. Her name is Officer Stacy Dunn, and uh, I remember I ambushed her to get into this program, she was going to get her a cup of coffee and I had read about the program. And uh, I was like, I know you got this program and I need to get in it. And she was like, okay, well, I need to run your name first. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> you know, wait a minute, <laughs> you know? But she said, you have to have a drug arrest, you know? And I joke with people, I was like, for the first time, you know, having a drug arrest turned out to be a good thing and it was. And she made a few phone calls and uh, she called a program and she said, can you get the 707 Everett? And I said, yeah, I'll get there. You know, and I remember I got there and Fred was there and, you know, I was, I was an addict at the time, so I got there kind of late, you know. And, Eric, and uh, Fred was on his way out the door. I think he was going home. Um, and uh, he stopped, he said, okay, I'm gonna do your intake. And he did my intake, and it wasn't a long, drawn-out process. He went over a couple questions, and he handed me a key, you know? And, and I was like, I was so happy to have a key to something. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I'm off the streets, you know? And then I remember them telling me, hey, you know you're going to go into treatment. And I was like, yeah, you know? And uh, I was ready for it. And I remember just, I mean, I'm thinking back now, I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do it without the housing piece. You know, it, it just, it just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible mm -hmm. to go to like treatment, but well, not for me anyway. And then have to go back out to the streets, yeah. you know? And even when I was in treatment, you know, I'm going to treatment. I remember I had to start to walk around the little area because now I got the, the guys who I used to buy drugs from, they see me trying to get right. You know, and it was like, hey, the first one's free. And, you know, I would talk to people and I was still kind of weak. I was still under 30 days, but I wanted it, you know. And also it was, you know, my peers and the people in the program that was in front of me. You know, I was talking to them and they was, I was never like, okay, this is where I was. You know, this is what I used to do, you know, and you can do it too. I wasn't sure, but, you know, I just held on another day. 
you know, and I just got, I just hit like eight years. You know, I just celebrated my eight years. You know, and I feel a part of the fam, a family, you know, and I feel the day I feel good. I, I feel the way I was trying to get drugs to make me feel, you know, and it's, it's nice to have friends I can call. It's nice for friends to call me. Um, and then there's another officer out there, uh, Officer Foch. We used to play cat and mouse. And I remember because he was always chasing me because I was always doing stuff, you know? But yeah, and my first job was cleaning safe. And he seen me at, at cleaning safe and he stopped it in the street, cut on the police lights and got out of his car. I'm like, I'm a, do I have a warrant or something? What'd I do? But he came over and he gave me a hug, you know? And that's another thing about this program, it, it changes the way, you know, we see people. Because before that, you know, I know there's good and bad officers, but before that, all of them was the enemy, mm. you know, and they're not, you know, you know, we learn to realize they do have a job to do if we're doing dirt, you know, but they, there are, there are good officers out there, you know, um, I done had jobs, I done been, I done worked in HR, uh, I done been a janitor, I done been, one of, one of my prior jobs, I was going into OSCI and CRCI once a week. You know, I was doing a, um, I had a curriculum I had to follow, a rancher group for other people like me. Not the one, and for the worst of the worst, who wanted to do it? You know, and I left HR to do that, to give back, to talk to people, to let them know that, you know, it is possible. Um, I had a whole lot of stuff I wanted to say before I got here, but, you know, and like they were Where talking about, oh, right now I work for Luke Dorf. I work for the rental assistance program. I help find housing and keep people with mental health issues uh, housed. Thank you. You know, and some of them have addiction issues, and so then they kind of put them with me, and I try to, there's one guy now, I'm taking him in NA meetings. He got about 30 days clean and sober, and he's really trying to do it, you know? And I know as far as each one of us in the program, we just don't get this and just hold on to it. You know, we try to reach out to somebody else, or at least pass the message to let them know that it is possible. Thank you for letting me Thank you. speak. Appreciate you. Commissioner you daily. I just had a comment and a quick question. First, I want to thank everyone for being here today um, and sharing your stories. I'm trying, I'm also trying not to cry. Um, last month was Second Chance Month. I had the opportunity to celebrate with Southeast Works that, you know, does some similar work with the community. And I listened to the stories there and it really struck me that the root of crime is not a bad person. It is poverty, it is addiction, it is mental illness, it is abuse and trauma, it is racism, it is lack of educational and economic opportunity. And um, there's no breaking the cycle without housing. That's the thing that I think is so, so vital about this uh, program. Um, it's a smart, efficient use of our resources, which is something I like to see. It's harm reduction for the individual served and for the community. Um, my question, so I just wanna thank you and I wanna congratulate everyone who stuck with the program. And um, my question is, you said it's voluntary, it's low barrier. Um, could you give me a sense of how many people you might serve in a given year versus how many people you think are in our community that would qualify for and benefit from this program? Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you're like, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and actually part of the, um, we have a, uh, an analyst that works with the Behavioral Health Unit and he does a trend analysis report that, I, that I'm pretty sure that you have. Um, but just to highlight through that, because it, it shows the need and the capacity. Um, approximately 200 individuals are referred to our program per quarter, so that is 800 individuals per year. And those are, are unique individuals, unique not the individuals same. Unique okay. individuals are referred to the program. Um, 
but in about 50% actually meet our criteria because there is a criteria. So we'd say 400 people um, are referred, so obviously there's the need, um, and we serve between like 130, 150. Um, so you understand that then there's a capacity issue um, when it's 400 people who meet criteria, but we can only serve so many. Um, so I just wanted to. Thank you. That's helpful. Is that Commissioner Fritz, then Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, Mayor, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for everybody being here. This is a great program that I've been a big fan of uh, throughout my time here. Mayor, is there any reason we can't add an emergency clause and vote on it today while all our friends are here? Uh, I'd refer to legal counsel. We would add an emergency clause. I move to add an emergency clause uh, because it's in the public interest to get this contract finalized as soon as possible. Second. We have a motion in a second. I see a head nod from legal counsel. Why don't we go ahead and take this issue up right now? Carla, please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? All right. The ordinance is amended. We'll keep that on. Just a few moments. We haven't actually voted all, on it all yet. We've, all we've done. Yeah, all we've, that's good practice. All we've done. It's great practice. Makes perfect. All we've done is we have voted to vote on this today, yes. as opposed to carrying this over for to a week as a non-emergency <laughs> order. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you. Um, I, I am so thrilled to live in a community that has central city concern. Um, it is a program that's proven over and over and over again that is really about the people that they engage with. What I love most about the program is that it's also an opportunity for people sometimes to get the first work that they've had in a long, long time. There's nothing like having someone in recovery uh, working with the people fresh in the door and so I am very grateful for the program. And my questions were really about the connection with the police and how the police interact with how this program works. I've actually had the opportunity to come to Central City and talk to folks who have gone through your Clean Start program. Um, and oh my gosh, I, I was in tears before I left. Uh, so I know the value, but I've known the value of Central City Concern for a very long time. Um, but I want to remind you, it is Central City Concern that is doing this work day in and day out, and it is the people that you're helping be healthy that are actually making our community better. So I want to thank all of you who are uh, either participants, graduates, uh, new employees uh, for the work that you take on each and every day. It is hard work. Um, it is not work that is... Uh, um, really understood in many communities. Uh, it takes a while, and I heard you say second chance. I suspect it's probably your 10th or 12th chance mm -hmm. before you actually got the opportunity that you took advantage of, right? Yes. Because I've known so many people in recovery that is, it just takes over and over and over again, but somebody has to care enough to give you that opportunity. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, it is sad to think that out of the 450 people you could serve, you only have resources to serve 160. And I would say even 450 would just be a drop in the bucket for what the need is in our community today. So right. thank, you. thank you. Very good. Is there a public testimony? Uh, does that complete your presentation, I should have asked? Yes. Very good. Is there a public testimony on this item, Carla? Yes, we have five people signed up. Very good. The first three are thank lightning. You. Thank you. Maggie and Jean Connett. And can I say one thing? Yeah, please. I know Commissioner Hardesty, you're going to come tour the program yes. on the on the 20th with your staff, and I I would love to tell you about how officers are involved yes. in a positive way with our with our clients because that it's very extensive. You got to know. I need to know that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and and to, 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 to clarify, the service coordination team is actually part of the Portland Police Bureau. Yes. Um, and due to the large number of items we have, and I don't want to lose our quorum, I hate to do this. I'm going to ask that we keep testimony to two minutes, but I'll be somewhat relaxed and gel about that. Lightning, would you like to go ahead and start? Yes, us, uh, my name is Lightning. <laughs> I, I represent Lightning Superhumanity. Again, this was probably one of the best presentations I've seen since I've been in here, and I've been in here a long time. 
as a think tank and researcher. And what's so impressive about this is the people that joined in with Central City Concern, they are the success here today. And I absolutely approve this going through. I approve from the people in this room on how they are in such support of what's going on here. And it's so important that they showed up and showed that to the public, to the people. That is the best presentation I've seen. And what Central City Concern is doing, I had no idea they were doing such wonderful work. I've had no idea. But till I had the people in here sit down and say that, so I understand that. Because one of the biggest concerns I had in the past as a landlord, I had some people who had some drug issues. I tried to keep them in my housing. The police overrode my decision and said, you're going to evict them immediately or I will shut you down. I said, well, shut me down. And they shut me down. They shut me down at any and all cost. So we need to start looking at it again from the housing standpoint of how can we have people in housing who may have an addiction that are in treatment still stay in housing in the private sector without being evicted? And that's a tough issue because now we're talking about the police. Now you're talking about having a policy in place to allow that to happen and an understanding if a landlord says they're in treatment, I want them in my housing. These are good people. These are my friends. These are people I want in my housing, in my communities, and I want to have that happen. That's my position on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I was really moved by the participants' testimony, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for coming. I think it's so important that the people who use the programs come and talk to you and tell you what's going on and how it's working out. I think you need to keep those lines of communication open. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, uh, we've got this whole shelter situation going on that's not working out. And uh, these women and men are afraid to come and talk to you about the fact that the laundry doesn't work, the showers are down, the bathrooms are down, and you know we've got disabled people, walkers, wheelchairs, uh, canes, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, bipolar, schizophrenia, you name it, we've got everything. And this is housing that violates the human rights codes. It violates the Eighth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. When it, when it comes to the bedding, the showers, the laundry, the, <clears throat> the uh, day rooms, it, it, it's, it's not meeting any human rights standard. And, and, and these people will not come talk to you because they're so traumatized. And I would love for you to, to have some op open communication with uh, these people who, who feel that they're gonna be retaliated against if they speak out. So that's all I have to say. Good, and, and this is a good program and, and should be continued, should be increased and emulated elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. You're so awesome, girl. Thank you so much for all you do, man. I love you, girl. Hey, guys. Morning. I don't know if I'm going to take two minutes or not. And when I leave here, all my friends say to me, what did, what did they say? Now, we all know, even the guy downstairs who does my wand, she goes upstairs, she yells at everybody, and then she leaves. I don't wait for a reaction. Look, CCC, that is a perfect example of a town I grew up in. I don't care about you guys. I don't care where you grew up. I know this. I know community. I know how to keep kids off drugs and in parks instead of gang bangs. And I'm at the Lloyd Center, and there's cops, and there's these teenagers, and this 14-year-old black little boy decided that he was going to act like he had a gun down the back of his pants pushing that cop. Ask me where I was. Where were you? I was right in between them, right where I belong. Portland police have informed me 
that uh, we are just a little map dot for uh, Danielle Outlaw. I'd like her to leave as fast as she could. I don't want to be with a police chief that has a dot on a map for my town. You guys don't like that? I don't really care. I'm getting really aggravated about it because when I'm out in the streets, which is all the time, I talk to these cops. They matter to me. At one point, Pointland had some of the best police in the world. Oh, except for New York. Because when I left here as a kid and ran away, I knew Dad thought I'd go to Cali, so I went to New York. It took me eight months to find me. I'd already made it, like, like the Sinatra said. I'm not dumb. I was raised and trained and taught here. Okay, maybe over there a little bit, but also a lot of Portland. So, I'm sorry I missed you at the parade. I'd love to see you on the street in St. John's, Oregon. I was there. I missed you by 10 minutes everywhere I went. You sorry to ask four cops. I was looking hard for you. <laughs> but hey, um, I do appreciate you showing up for our parade that started the year after I was born. It's a great parade. It's so, one of the best. Um, I want to tell you one other thing. Quickly, I want please. TPI out of my state. When I got to Portland, they said, don't go to TPI, don't go to TPI. I couldn't understand why. Then everybody who boosts goes to TPI, and they all exchange drugs and all kinds. I have witnessed all this. You want testimony? I have no problem. Very good. Thank CCC you. CCC is wonderful, is not part of what we're but I'd really today. like to get TPI out got of Portland. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Next three, please. The last two who signed up are Charles Bridge Crane and Mary Seip. Mary, do you want to start off, please? I'll start as soon as she's you. finished. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Seip. Um, as you know, I've been coming here for the last little over two years, and um, recently I've had to miss a few meetings because my new job is interfering with my civic engagement. <laughs> but I have to say, I couldn't be happier that I was able to be here today. Like lightning, I have to say, this is the most profound presentation and experience uh, that I've had coming to city council. Um, I just, uh, I wish we were talking about $50 million, not $6 million. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we'll somehow find uh, more money uh, to expand this program. Um, Congratulations to everyone who's been through the program that's here today. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I want to kind of point out is that people that go through the program are being given the support and the tools and everything. They're the ones who did the work. The ones who come out the other end who and succeed, they did the work. And congratulations for that. Um, I'm so happy to, to be able to look at this and not look at the 31 uh, percent success rate, because that's really not what it is. It's a, it's a number of lives, is what I look at, that have been changed for the better. And what I'm also hearing from these people that spoke today, had they not been through the experience that they've been through and been at the, at the bottom of their lives, they now are not just mediocre, ordinary citizens. They are now exemplary citizens who have this desire to give back to the community. And uh, I see this transformation, and I'm just absolutely blown away by it. And I also just, the last statement I want to make is, is that this, to me, is also an example that not all interactions with the police department are negative. And the collaboration of this police program, the, the SRT, is an example of how working together and giving the police this tool that those those collaborations can result in very positive interactions. Kudos. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good noon, give or take four minutes. Uh, Charles Bridge Crane Johnson. And I would like to be happy like uh, Mary and Lightning. Um, but the Oregonian um, and the inadequate response to what the Oregon Oregonian has revealed way back in June of last year, the newsroom found that 4,437 homeless people, 260 more than the survey, point in time survey, counted, were arrested by Portland police last year. 
4,437. Um, she spoke about servicing um, between 130 and 150 in a year. So Commissioner Udaley's question was extremely on point when she asked about uh, the capacity versus the demand. Um, and as we move forward towards election time and we figure out uh, who's gonna replace our esteemed Commissioner Amanda Fritz and who's gonna be challenging the mayor, um, we, Mary mentioned uh, $50 million um, because we did find somewhere between 80 and $100 million to rehab the Portland building. I don't remember whether that was via bonds or current revenue. Uh, this county uh, worked with the state to find about a similar amount of money to build a brand frickin' new courthouse. Um, so we have some priorities. It doesn't seem that we have 4,437 priorities. Um, that was in, I don't, I think usually it's Gordon Friedman from the Oregonian here. I think it would be great if uh, Helen Young and Ms. Uh, Gunderson could send uh, Rebecca Willington some more. Because really this city needs to work harder on all aspects of the 4,437 number. First of all, a tremendous waste of police resources. The 4,437 people should not have been arrested in that volume. Um, maybe there was one murder in there. Maybe there were zero. Uh, maybe there were, that article could be enhanced with crimes against persons information. And secondly, uh, it mismatches the point in time count. So the people who are doing our homeless services need to really engage with Capstone and other places about getting us good data so we can chase money hard to put it to work at great value for our dollar, getting people into housing first. It's the only thing that's gonna save us from the talk about picking up needles off the sidewalk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, uh, Charles, before you leave, um, I wanna thank you for bringing that up because we tend to either talk about places all good and all bad. And what we need is a system that actually works for the community. And so I appreciate you reminding us that last year, 54% of the arrest of people by Portland police, but for being houseless, those folks would have never ever entered our criminal justice system. And so we have a responsibility and obligation to make sure we're not exacerbating the harm to community members who are suffering from a whole host of community issues. So I applaud you for bringing that up. This is a day of celebration, so I, I don't wanna be a downer, but the reality is we cannot talk about one without talking about the other. So thank you very much. I appreciate you for bringing that to us. Thank you, and speaking of celebration, tomorrow is World Accessibility Day, the ALS Foundation, so keep that in mind. Uh, things not exactly a celebration, but also a rededication to accessibility work. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Very good. So we have amended this ordinance to be an emergency ordinance, so we will now call the roll on the ordinance as amended. This is actually the vote. Carla. Okay, hang on. Fish? Well, I'm pleased to support the ordinance. Um, uh, Commissioner Fritz and I have been on the council uh, throughout the 10 plus years that, that this program has been in operation. And I think it was Commissioner Randy Leonard who was really the early champion for it. And then a succession of mayors funded it even though we hit some bumps in, in recessions and other periods of time where it made it difficult to find the funds. But it's, it's obviously making a difference in the lives of people and it confirms what we know around supportive housing and all of our most effective programs which is when you marry deeply affordable housing with services people need to become self-sufficient, you have the best chance of getting people back on their feet and becoming productive members of our community. And the folks that are here who are graduates of the program are our testimony to that. Um, I want to join with my colleagues in thanking Central City Concern. Um, and it's interesting that a number of people who testified said they're now eligible for living in the Blackburn. Well, the Blackburn, of course, is new Central City Concern Housing, part of a public-private partnership that is uh, named in honor of Ed Blackburn, longtime executive director, who has uh, so much to do with the success of this organization. Um, uh, this, this has been a particularly uplifting uh, presentation, and all of us and our families 
uh, somewhere in our families have someone who has been struggling with addiction and has hit, hit a bump in the road and things haven't always gone smoothly. And what we, what we depend on is the community to lift uh, folks up who are experiencing that bump. And this is a marvelous example of that. Uh, I wish we had more resources to expend, but for the 150 or so people that we're serving and the graduates of the program and the people who have a second and third chance and who come back, this is, this is really important work. So uh, I'm pleased to join with my colleagues today in, in voting aye. Aye. Hardesty? This has been a very moving uh, city council meeting. I'm, I'm always struck when uh, the city council meeting uh, reflects the diversity of this community. Uh, it is rare to have so many people of color in these chambers. And so what I'd like to say to the people of color who showed up today in support of Central City Concern, please don't let this be your last time in this chamber. If you're not registered to vote, get registered to vote. Uh, please read city council agendas, educate yourself on the decisions that we're making, because every single time we're here, we're having an impact on your life. And if you're not weighing in, then we're making decisions about you without you. I want you to know how, yes. Um, I have a great admiration for our Central City Concern and the work that they've done. Uh, but again, I think that it's always important that we evaluate the outcomes that we're looking for and that we just don't take anybody at their word for anything. I am someone that follows the money, I follow outcomes, and I am results oriented. And today, I say hands, my, hand, my hat is off to Central City Concern, well done program, well done with the participants in the program. And one of the things I love most is that it's not just let's put you through 30 days and then we kick you out and then you're on your own. Uh, we need more programs that actually work with people where they are and give them the opportunity to do better. I believe when you know better, you do better. I vote aye. You daily. Uh, well, we all know it's exponentially more expensive and more difficult to serve people in crisis on the streets, and this program is helping uh, to address that and address a crisis that really runs a lot deeper than the c compelling personal stories that we heard today. It's a failure. It's our failure as a society to serve and support the basic needs and human rights of all of our citizens. Um, I would love if we could expand this program. Uh, for now, I am pleased to support uh, extending this contract with Central City Concern. And thank you again for everyone who came here today and for all your good work. I vote aye. Fritz. Thanks to everybody who took the time to be here today and particularly for taking the time to go through the program and to do the, the really hard work. And particularly thanks to Emily, to the former um, coordinator, Austin Raglioni. I echo Commissioner Fish's um, thanks for Commissioner Randy Leonard, who with Mayor Tom Potter started this program. And uh, the contract previously, I believe, was with Volunteers of America. I think when it comes back in 2022, it might be um, instructive to look at the difference in outcomes um, so that where that would be um, helpful for moving forward as to which great community organization continues to provide these services. But it is, and it is, um, a truly a collaborative effort with the Portland Police Bureau. It's been funded through the Police Bureau for so many years. I appreciate hearing some of the personal stories of personal officers who gave a hug, who did the outreach, who took you to get in and who helped you through um, some of the worst times of your life to now hopefully some of the best times of your life. I loved the story of uh, the, uh, the movie night. I know that there's a lot of um, entertain things. How to have fun without doing drugs and alcohol is a really important skill to learn. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part, have been a part of this program for so many years and I wish you all the best continuing. Aye. Wheeler. Well, I, I could not be prouder 
of this program. And I want to thank the Portland Police Bureau for their management of this program. I want to thank the District Attorney's Office for their engagement in this and their willingness to give people second chances. And I want to thank the service providers, particularly Central City Concerned, since we're here today to discuss the extension of the contract. And, and I will vote to do so without reservation. This continues an important relationship that's existed for many years. As you heard, they provide access to housing, service treatment, access to mental health services, coordination with the Behavioral Health Unit, which is another Portland Police Bureau unit that focuses uh, exclusively on people in crisis experiencing mental health on our streets, uh, and most importantly, connecting people to their own potential. And as you've heard all my colleagues say, you did the lion's share of the work. You did it yourself. Some of you acknowledged that the program had to be there. There had to be a place to work with you and extend a helping hand. Uh, and that is acknowledged through our strong support of this program. But the reality is you did it. And I cannot even put myself into your shoes to imagine what it took to get to here. And all I can do is sit here and tell you, I'm cheering for you. I support you. I will continue to support this program and others like it so that other people who are still out there, still living on the street, still exposed to the elements, still struggling to find their futures can have that opportunity too. And you, by being here and being willing to testify and show your faces and, and be part of this, you are now serving as an example to many, many other people who will see this or they'll hear about it or they'll find out about it and they'll say, they did it. I can do it too. And that is the, the, the strongest kind of leadership that I can think of that, that you are providing. Um, I also want to thank the folks who, who work in the behavioral health unit, although that's not the, the subject of the conversation today. It's a, a, an important sister relationship to this program. The overall reason why the police bureau wants to lead and manage this program and has for so many years is because the stated goal is to reduce interactions between people in crisis on our streets with police officers and increase interactions with people who are trained and have the resources to be able to help people recover their lives. Uh, this has been a 10-year program. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the funding of this program. Uh, until last year, this program was funded on a one-time only basis, colleagues, meaning we were only funding it year to year. We did not have permanent funding. And this is a program that's strongly supported by people in the business community. And they came to us and said, if you're going to increase the business licensing tax on businesses in this community, we would really appreciate it if you would provide permanent ongoing funding for the service coordination team. And so that's what we did. That's, that's a partner that's not in the room today, but I want to acknowledge their work. Uh, and with regard to capacity, I also want to acknowledge two things. Number one, because this is ultimately administered, and according to the district attorney's website, this is a crime reduction program. As one of our, our incredible testifiers said today, the only way you get into this program is if there is some interaction with law enforcement. And it's, it's sad to me that, that the only way you can gain access to what's a really incredible program is through some nexus with law enforcement. And I think really the next step for us is figuring out this street response and how we can address people in crisis who aren't having interactions with the police. Why should we be waiting until that happens in order to give somebody the lifeline that they need to be successful? Um, we tried to expand the behavioral health unit and the service coordination team last year. We had some funds that, that I'd hoped that we could allocate even on a one-time basis to expand the program. And what we found was uh, the shortage isn't on our side. The shortage is actually on the service provider side of the equation. They're, they're, th this is a specialty field. It is a complex field. It is a very difficult field. There are many, many services that are arrayed together under the umbrella of the service coordination team. And we found that we actually need to do more to help the capacity building 
of our social service partners outside the city of Portland. And so that's something we continue to engage in as well. Um, so thank you, uh, commissioners, for making this an emergency ordinance so that we could vote on it today and show the respect that the men and this women deserve by continuing to support this program. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted this amendment. Thank you for being here. All right, we're gonna skip backwards to, I left undone, item number 421. If you could read that, please. 421, appeal of Elliot Mantell against hearing officer's decision of denial for a conditional use review for the Everett House Community Healing Center in the former homes at 2917 and 2927 Northeast Everett Street and 2926 Northeast Flanders Street, LU 18-190331CU. Colleagues, this is, we have already heard testimony on this. Uh, we have heard presentations. We have already taken a tentative vote on this item. This is our final vote. I move that the council grant the appeal, overturn the decisions of the hearings officer, and adopt the findings, but change the date on pages one and seven to reflect today's date, May 15th. Do I have a second? second. I have moved. I have a second from Commissioner Fish. Is there any further discussion on this item? Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Um, I need to make an announcement before I vote on this. Uh, uh, as per legal counsel, I want to uh, let you know that on March 20. No, oh, you're not on the. That's oh. not. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it is, uh, so I just needed to make a statement that said I have reviewed the records of, of the hearing I had to leave early, uh, and I am prepared to vote on this item today, and I vote no. You daily. Aye. Fritz. I am very troubled by this uh, decision of the council, well, when, um, and also I don't, uh, some of the findings I think are, are, are troubling. The city council, it says on page 15, the city council further finds that the overall maximum of 65 members and guests at the facility, limiting the number of members of guests at any one class, will limit the intensity and scale of those activities so that the overall residential appearance and function of the area will not be significantly lessened. As I said at the hearing, if there were 65 people coming and going every day of the week at my home, I would not find that uh, compatible with the residential area. No. Wheeler. I vote aye. The motion carries. We go back now to the consent agenda. Two items were pulled off the consent agenda. 424, please. Uh, Carla, who pulled did, this? Um, Lightning pulled these two. Did we get rid of 436? The um, Not yet. Okay, so we're yeah. 424, pay Lightning employment He's not. lawsuit of Gail anyway. Thompson Ivory in the sum of $200,000 involving the Portland Bureau of Human Resources. Is Lightning here? Nope. I don't see him. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. You daily. Thanks for being here, Bucky. Aye. Fritz. Thanks for being here all morning. Aye. <laughs> Wheeler. At least you did get to hear a very <laughs> interesting presentation, uh, but it was important that you be here, and we thank you for that. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. 425, please. Pay property damage claim of the Archdiocese of Portland in Oregon in the sum of $19,316 involving Portland Bureau of Environmental Services. Was this also pulled by lightning? Yes. Is he here? No. Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. You Daly? Aye. Fritz? Thank you for being here. Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 436, please. Amend contract with Brown and Caldwell, Inc. for professional engineering services for the Alder Pump Station upgrade, project number E10359, in the amount of $85,000. Commissioner Fish. Colleagues and Mayor, the uh, Environmental Services has completed a major upgrade of the Alder pump station to improve reliability and increase pumping capacity. 
These improvements prevent sewage releases to buildings and help prevent combined sewer and stormwater overflows to the Willamette River. Before the pump station was upgraded, it was a weak link in the city's combined sewer overflow control program, other known, otherwise known as the, as the Big Pipe Project. For example, during heavy rains in October of 2017, while the rest of the system prevented overflows to the Willamette River, a 14-minute over, uh, overflow occurred from a single location, the Alder Pump Station. With upgrades complete and capacity increased, this ordinance uh, addresses one last amendment to the project. By the way, so far as this year, there have been zero overflows. As I often say, the big pipe continues to make a big difference. Here to give us a brief presentation are Aaron Lawler and Paul Sudo, both from Environmental Services. Welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor Wheeler, uh, morning. commissioners. Um, uh, for the record, I'm Paul Sudo, engineering manager with uh, BES. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. I'm Aaron Lawler, Engineer with DES Treatment and Pumping Systems Division uh, and the Design Project Manager for this project. Um, go ahead. Uh, so we are here today on ordinance um, for Amendment 7 to the Brown and Caldwell contract. Uh, the ordinance itself reads, um, amend contract with Brown and Caldwell, Inc. for professional engineering services for the Alder pump station upgrades. Um, and I just want to uh, mention that these funds are requested as an amendment for uh, additional design services during construction. So what we have here is a map um, showing the project location. Uh, Alder Pump Station is located at the corner of Southeast Alder and Southeast Water Avenue um, with I-5 on ramp from the Morrison Bridge above. Um, the site's quite small and uh, it's located in the northwest corner of that block and we affectionately refer to it as a postage stamp property. Uh, <clears throat> this project drastically improved the operation and functionality of the Alder Pump Station. Since the completion of the east side CSO tunnel, uh, combined sewer overflow, uh, Alder has historically been the weakest link in the system and typically the first location where overflows to the river would occur. In fact, since the east side CSO system uh, was completed in 2011, there have been four instances where Alder Pump Station was the only source of overflow to the river. Through this project, we have nearly tripled the sanitary pumping capacity, reduced the uh, capacity of the pump sending flows to the river, simplified pump station operation, integrated pump stations into the east side CSO system, and provide seismic resiliency using micropiles. So uh, here we have uh, some photos of the original pump station um, located southeast Portland on the corner of Alder and Walder, Water. Um, <clears throat> this is an area of town that has seen a lot of development since the pump station was last rehabbed in 1993. Uh, uh, this slide right here contains a view from the ground level looking into the dry well pump room of the original pump station prior to renovation um, and gives you a picture of the aging equipment. Uh, Alder Pump Station is a caisson style pump station which essentially is a circular pump station that is below ground. The original configuration used a dry well wet well design um, and had two separate wet wells, one for sanitary flows and one for storm events. Uh, the dry well was essentially a pump room, as we saw in the previous slide, and it housed pumps and piping. Um, <clears throat> the previous configuration was complicated and had uh, uh, limited access for maintenance. Um, this slide is a bird's eye view of what the inside of the caisson looked like prior to this project. As you can see, it's a bit complicated configuration and flow path. Um, consisting of two sanitary pumps and two storm pumps. The sanitary pumps would pump as much flow as they could to the southeast interceptor and eventually to the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant. However, during storm events or localized high flow events, the storm pumps would, would be used to send flow directly to the river. Adding to the complexity of the pump station and this project, Alder Pump Station service area was unique to the remainder of the combined sewer areas of the city in that the majority of the other sewer basins have a robust intertie with the CSO system. Uh, <clears throat> this project addressed this deficiency by reconfiguring the pumping levels to take full advantage of the intertie with the east side CSO tunnel for storage, nearly tripling the sanitary pumping capacity and reducing overflow pumping capacity. These modifications along with seismic resiliency and operational and maintenance improvements have greatly increased the reliability and functionality of the Alder pump station. 
these are some photos uh, during construction, just so you can see what a day-to-day -day looks like for us. Um, as you can see, everything from the existing pump station was demolished except for the original concrete caisson. However, we did modify the inside of the caisson as well. Um, this is a view of the caisson um, from the ground level. Um, looking down, you can see all the chambers have been demolished. Um, you can see the micro piles being installed. Uh, those are basically piles that are driven down to bedrock about 135 feet below um, the bottom of the caisson there. Um, and this provides uh, seismic resiliency, which will uh, protect the environment and human health and safety after a seismic event. And then here we have uh, more recent photos as construction nears completion at Alder. Uh, the design maximized the use of this small site and provided a much needed improvement to the pump station. So that was an overview of the project, um, but we're here today regarding an ordinance related to a final amendment. Um, as some of you may recall, this project has been presented to council on various occasions in the past, starting in 2012. Um, because of the long history of the project, we were asked to make a final report to council um, for this ordinance. Uh, the project was initiated in 2011, and since then we have had six approved amendments by council and four, or six approved amendments and four presentations to council pertaining to ordinances. Um, and I just want to run through them right now. Um, so ordinance 185681 was a uh, contract award presentation for the original um, contract, PTE contract with Brown and Caldwell Engineering, and that occurred in 2012. Um, amendment one was a uh, administrative amendment to add a subconsultant to the contract and resulted in no change to the contract amount. Ordinance number 186764, uh, contract amendment two, uh, was a presentation to council in August 2014, and it was a major scope change on, uh, based on information gained during the pre-design of the project. Uh, the original scope of the project when it was initiated was to just replace the mechanical and electrical equipment. Uh, the change in scope resulted in a major pump station upgrade, and this change was presented uh, and approved by council in 2014. Uh, contract Amendment 3 was another subconsultant change to the original contract and did not uh, amend the cost of the contract. Uh, contract Amendment 4 was a uh, presentation to and approval by Council in October 2016. Uh, the amendment added frontage improvements to the design scope of the project at the request of PBOT to meet ADA requirements. Um, Ordinance number 188131 was a presentation to Council in November uh, 2016, requ requesting and receiving authorization to put uh, the project out to bid for construction and award a contract in the amount up to $3.5 million. Amendment 5 was a change in BS project manager from the previous manager to yours truly um, due to the retirement of the previous project manager. And Amendment 6 was an extension to the contract uh, duration with Brown and Caldwell and, and no contract amount change. So that's a past description of amendments and ordinances. Uh, and then we have an overview of the schedule here just to show you the, the history of the project. It was initiated in 2011 um, and at summer of 2019 will be completed with this project. Um, so we're here today regarding the final amendment and the ordinance associated with Brown and Caldwell PTE contract for Alder Pump Station in the amount of $85,000. Uh, the current contract amount is $741,789, and this amendment would bring the final contract amount to $826,789. Um, through the life of the project, we have been successful at maintaining the utilization of disadvantaged minority women-owned uh, and emerging small businesses, uh, and that percentage of utilization has been uh, above 33%, and with this amendment, we will maintain that uh, percentage as well. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, that's a pretty good percentage. Can you tell me the breakdown? What's women? What are minority business owners? Uh, what are just emerging small businesses? Any idea? Um, uh, I don't have that information handy with me, uh, Commissioner Hardesty, but we can follow up um, prior to the second reading next week. Um, and Appreciate and that because that's a consistent question I have, and I, it would just be great if you guys came prepared to answer that every time you came here. Yeah. Then we wouldn't have to do it again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So our, our recommendation is uh, for council approval to authorize the contract amendment in this ordinance. And uh, that concludes our presentation. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? 
I had one, and it's just sort of you know a basic question. So on the construction, you're going all the way down to the bedrock for a tank that's submerged underground. That that sort of surprised me, I guess. It, it has to do with uh, the seismic movement of the earth during uh, the Cascadia subduction event. So uh, there'd be liquefaction of the soils, and so our, our actual caisson would shift in uh, position. Okay. So we, we tie it to the bedrock so it doesn't move. That's interesting. It looked pretty complex. It was, uh, it was a fun project. Interesting. Good. Thank you for that. And I appreciate that. For, for me, I really appreciate the photographs so I can actually understand it. Thank you. It was well done. Uh, any public testimony, Carla, on this item? Uh, just Maggie had signed up. She I do left. not see her. I believe she is gone. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Colleagues, we're adjourned to 2 p.m. I, I also just wanted to give you a bit of an administrative heads up. I'm going to be returning our first time certain item at 2 back. We're going to move it to next week. Um, the last item on the agenda this afternoon is a 4 p.m. time certain. So I just want you to be aware it is highly likely we will take a break in the middle of our afternoon session. And I just wanted to uh, make you aware of that great new opportunity. We are adjourned. <laughs>